American Power and the New Mandarin's Noam Chomsky Pantheon Books, A Division of Random House M. New York. The excerpts from Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell, on pages 145-46, are reprinted by permission of Harcourt, Brace and World, Incorporated Copyright 1952 by Sonia Brown L. Orwell. The first part of Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship is based on a lecture by the same title originally delivered as part of the Albert Schweitzer Lecture Series at New York University which appears in Power and Consciousness in Society, New York University Press, New York. We gratefully acknowledge permission by the Schweitzu program in the humanities to use this work. Second Printing Copyright Copyright 1967, 1969 by Noam Chomsky All rights reserved under international and pan-American copyright conventions Published in the United States by Pantheon Books, a division of Random House, Incorporated, New York, and simultaneously in Canada by Random House of Canada Limited, Toronto. Library of Congress Catalog Guard Number 6911864. Manufactured in the United States of America by the Haddon Craftsman, Incorporated, Scranton, Pa. Designed by Joan Barstone. To the brave young men who refused to serve in a criminal war. Contents. Introduction 3 Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship 23 The Revelationary Pacifism of A.J. Must. On the backgrounds of the Pacific War 159 The Logic of Withdrawal 221 The Bitter Heritage. A review 295 Some Thoughts on Intellectuals and the Schools 309 The Responsibility of Intellectuals 323 On Resistance 367 Supplement to On Resistance 387 Epilogue 401 American Power and the New Mandarins Introduction Three years have passed since American intervention in the Civil War in Vietnam was converted into a colonial war of the classic type. This was the decision of a liberal American administration. Like the earlier steps to enforce our will in Vietnam, it was taken with the support of leading political figures, intellectuals, and academic experts many of whom now oppose the war because they do not believe that American repression can succeed in Vietnam and therefore urge, on pragmatic grounds, that we take our stand where the prospects are more hopeful. If the resistance in Vietnam were to collapse, if the situation were to revert to that of Thailand or Guatemala or Greece, where the forces of order, with our approval and assistance, are exercising a fair degree of control, then this opposition to the Vietnam War would also cease, in the words of one such spokesman, we might then all be saluting the wisdom and statesmanship of the American government. One if we are forced to liquidate this enterprise in one of the two possible ways. A. A. M. E. R. I. California. N. P. O. W. E. R. A. N. D. The N. U. M. A. N. D. H. A. R. I. N. S. The liberal ideologists will continue to urge that we organize and control as extensive a dominion as is feasible in what they take to be a national interest and in the interest of the elements in other societies that we designate as fit to rule. As matters now stand, it appears unlikely that Vietnamese resistance will collapse. The United States seems unable to muster the military force to crush this resistance and to guarantee the dominance of the government and social institutions that we have determined to be appropriate. There is, therefore, some hope that American troops will be withdrawn and the Vietnamese left to try to reconstruct something from the wreckage. The course of history may be determined, to a very significant degree by what the people of the United States will have learned from this catastrophe. Three times in a generation American technology has laid waste a helpless Asian country. In 1945 this was done with a sense of moral rectitude that was, and remains, almost unchallenged. 
In Korea, there were a few qualms. The amazing resistance of the Vietnamese has finally forced us to ask, what have we done? There are, at last, some signs of awakening to the horrifying reality. Resistance to American violence and to the militarization of our own society has become, if not a significant force, at least a detectable one. There is hope that the struggle against racism and exploitation at home can be linked with a struggle to remove the heavy Yankee boot from the necks of oppressed people throughout the world. Twenty years of intensive Cold War indoctrination and seventy years of myth regarding our international role make it difficult to face these issues in a serious way. There is a great deal of intellectual debris to be cleared away. Ideological pressures so overpowering that even their existence was denied must be examined and understood. The search for alternatives. 4. Introduction. For individuals, for American society, for the international order as a whole, has barely begun, and no one can guess where it will lead. Quite possibly it will lead nowhere, cut off by domes tick repression or its functional equivalent. To use a favorite term of the present administration, the dominance of a liberal technocracy who will serve the existing social order in the belief that they represent justice and humanity, fighting limited wars at home and overseas to preserve stability, promising that the future will be better if only the dispossessed will wait patiently, and supported by an apathetic, obedient majority its mind and conscience dulled by a surfeit of commodities and by some new version of the old system of beliefs and ideas. Perhaps the worst excesses may be eliminated. Perhaps a way may be found to bring about a fundamental change in American society of a sort that can hardly be envisioned today. A great many people have been aroused by the Vietnam tragedy and the domestic crisis. There is a new mood of questioning and rebellion among the youth of the country, a very healthy and hopeful development, by and large, that few would have predicted a decade ago. The passionate involvement of students in the civil rights movement, in the movement to end the war, in resistance, in community organizing, already has changed the intellectual and moral climate of the universities at least. These stirrings of concern and commitment give some reason to hope that we will not repeat the crimes of the recent past. One thing is certain, we must never forget these crimes. It is just half a century since Randolph Bourne, in his remarkably perceptive essays, warned that the old philosophy, the old radicalism, has found a perfectly definite level, and there is no reason to think it will not remain there. Its flowering appears in the technical organization of the war by an earnest group of young liberals, who direct their course by an ipatu. And American power and the new manda are Ryan's NIST program of state socialism at home and a league of benevolently imperialistic nations abroad. The pragmatic liberalism that worked when we were trying to get that material foundation for American life in which more impassioned living could flourish was now helpless in creating new values and setting at once a large standard to which the nations might bear. He wrote of the enthusiasm with which liberal intellectuals A.C. accepted the war once America had joined in, of the high mood of confidence and self-righteousness the keen sense of control over events. The war has revealed a younger intelligentsia, drained up in the pragmatic dispensation, immensely ready for the executive ordering of events, pitifully unprepared for the intellectual interpretation or the idealistic focusing of ends. They have absorbed the secret of scientific method as applied to political administration. They are liberal, enlightened, aware. They are touched with creative intelligence toward the solution of political and industrial problems. They are a wholly new force in American life, the product of the swing in the colleges from a training that emphasized classical studies to one that emphasized political and economic values. Practically all this element, one would say, is lined up in service of the war technique. 
There seems to have been a peculiar congeniality between the war and these men. It is as if the war and they had been waiting for each other. What is significant is that it is the technical side of the war that appeals to them, not the interpretative or political side. The formulation of values and ideals, the production of articulate and suggestive thinking, had not, in their education, kept pace, to any extent whatever, with a technical aptitude. Dewey's disciples have learned all too literally the instrumental attitude toward life, and, being immensely intelligent and energetic, they are making themselves efficient instruments of the war technique, accepting backslash if little question the ends as announced from above. Two. Born is describing, not the new frontier, the new mandarins of the 1960s, but the liberal and radical intellectuals of 6. Introduction. 191 7. His essay is entitled Twilight of Idols. With the Vietnam War, twilight has turned to midnight. In the same essay, Bourne speaks with hope of the thorough malcontents with their irritation at things as they are, disgust at the frustrations and aridities of American life, deep dissatisfaction with self and with the groups that give themselves as hopeful out of such moods they might be hammered new values. The malcontents would be men and women who could not stomach the war, or the reactionary idealism that has followed in its train. They are quite through with the professional critics and classicists who have let cultural values die through their own personal ineptitude. Yet these malcontents have no intention of being cultural vandals, only to slay. They are not barbarians, but seek the vital and the sincere everywhere. Eight. He speaks with hope that a more skeptical, malicious, deparate, ironical mood may actually be the sign of more vivid and more stirring life fermenting in America today. Malcontentedness may be the beginning of promise. The post-war repression all but destroyed this promise. Today, as the Cold War ideology is collapsing and American power is proving incapable of achieving dominance over Asia, there is once again the smell of repression in the air. If we can learn anything from history, we will find a way to avoid the arrogance and divisiveness that has been the curse of the left and unite to resist this repression, to realize the promise that might grow from malcontentedness, to replace the allure of the martial in war and the allure of the technical by the allure of fresh and true ideas, of free speculation, of artistic figure, of cultural styles of intelligence suffused by feeling, and feeling given fiber and outline by intelligence. These words of Bourne's are no program for action, but an injunction to seek such a program and create for ourselves, for others, the understanding that can give it life. There. 7. American power and the Enumander R. Brian S. has been little advance in this direction since he wrote. Given the present realities of American power, the challenge becomes an urgent, desperate necessity. The essays collected here are, for the most part, highly critical of the role that American intellectuals have played in designing and implementing policy, interpreting historical events, and formulating an ideology of social change that in part falsifies, in part restricts and subverts it. Because of this critical tone, I want to make it clear at the outset that if any note of self-righteousness creeps in, it is unintended and, more important, unjustified. No one who involved himself in anti-war activities as late as 1965, as I did, has any reason for pride or satisfaction. This opposition was 10 or 15 years too late. This is one lesson we should have learned from the tragedy of Vietnam. For the most part, these essays are elaborated versions of lectures given over the past few years. During these years, I have taken part in more conferences, debates, forums, teachings, meetings on Vietnam and American imperialism than I care to remember. Perhaps I should mention that, increasingly, I have had a certain feeling of falseness in these lectures and discursions. 
This feeling does not have to do with the intellectual issues. The basic facts are clear enough. The assessment of the situation is as accurate as I can make it. But the entire performance is emotionally and morally false in a disturbing way. It is a feeling that I have occasionally been struck by before. For example, I remember reading an excellent study of Hitler's East European policies a number of years ago in a mood of grim fascination. The author was trying hard to be cool and scholarly and objective, to stifle the only human response to a plan to enslave and destroy millions of subhuman organisms so that the inheritors of the spiritual values of Western civilization would. I. Introduction. Be free to develop a higher form of society in peace. Controlling this elementary human reaction, we enter into a technical debate with the Nazi intelligentsia, is it technically feasible to dispose of millions of bodies? What is the evidence that the Slavs are inferior beings? Must they be ground under foot or returned to their natural home in the East so that this great culture can flourish? to the benefit of all mankind. Is it truth that the Jews are a cancer eating away at the vitality of the German people? And so on. Without awareness, I found myself drawn into this morass of insane rationality inventing arguments to counter and demolish the constructions of the Bormans and the Rosenbergs. By entering into the arena of argument and counter-argument, of technical feasibility and tactics, of footnotes and citations, by accepting the presumption of legitimacy of debate on certain issues, one has already lost one's humanity. This is the feeling I find almost impossible to repress when going through the motions of building a case against the American war in Vietnam. Anyone who puts a fraction of his mind to the task can construct a case that is overwhelming. Surely this is now obvious. In an important way, by doing so he degrades himself, and insults beyond measure the victims of our violence and our moral blindness. There may have been a time when American policy in Vietnam was a debatable matter. This time is long past. It is no more debatable than the Italian war in Abyssinia or the Russian suppression of Hungarian freedom. The war is simply an obscenity. A depraved act by weak and miserable men, including all of us, who have allowed it to go on and on with endless fury and destruction all of us who would have remained silent had stability and order been secured. It is not pleasant to use such words, but candor permits no less. 9. American power a n d t h e n u m a n d a r r i n s the things we have seen and read during these horrible years surpass belief. I have in front of me now an associated press photo from the New York Times with this caption. Homeless children, girl holds her wounded baby sister as South Vietnamese rangers move through their hamlet. Children had been rescued from a bunker under their house, burnt down when U.S. helicopters fired on Viet Cong. The scene is the Mekong Delta southwest of Saigon. I cannot describe the pathos of this scene, or the expression on the face of the wounded child. How many hundreds of such pictures must we see before we begin to care and to act? I suppose this is the first time in history that a nation has so openly and publicly exhibited its own war crimes. Perhaps this shows how well our free institutions function. Or does it simply show how immune we have become to suffering? Probably the latter. So at least it would seem, when we observe how opposition to the war has grown in recent months. There is no doubt that the primary cause for this opposition is that the cost of the war to us is too great, unacceptable. It is deplorable, but nonetheless true that what has changed American public opinion and the domestic political picture is not the efforts of the peace movement still less the declarations of any political spokesmen but rather the Vietnamese resistance, which simply will not yield to American force. Backslash fat is more, the responsible attitude is that opposition to the war on grounds of cost is not, as I have said, deplorable, but rather admirable.
in keeping with the genius of American politics. American politics is a politics of accommodation that successfully excludes moral considerations. Therefore, it is quite proper a further demonstration of our superior acuity that only pragmatic considerations of cost and utility guide our actions. When, Martin Luther. 10. Introduction. King was assassinated, Kenneth Clerk said that you have to weep for this country. Are we to weep, or to laugh, when we read in the editorial columns of our great newspapers? and in much of the left liberal press, that the health of our democratic system has been confirmed by Johnson's speech of L backslash large 3-1. With the collapse of his Vietnam policies, a serious international economic crisis, and domestic turmoil threatening to make the country impossible to govern, the president made a noble and magnanimous gesture the ultimate sacrifice for peace, in the words of one senator. He announced that he would not seek renomination. This proves the viability of American democracy. By these standards, a still more viable democracy was that of fascist Japan in the late 1930s, where more than a dozen cabinets fell under not dissimilar circumstances. The health of our system would have been demonstrated by a change of policy caused by a recognition that what we have done in Vietnam is wrong, a criminal act that an American victory would have been a tragedy. Nothing could be more remote from the American political consciousness. So long as this remains true, we are fated to relive this horror. The primary reason for opposition to the war is its cost to us. A second cause is the feeling that the cost to its victims is too great. At first glance, this reaction seems to be at a higher moral level than the first, but this is questionable. The principle that we should retract our claws when the victim bleeds too much is hardly an elevated one. What about opposition to the war on the grounds that we have no right to stabilize or restructure Vietnamese society, or to carry out the experiments with material and human resources control that delight the pacification theorist? Such opposition is slight, and in the political arena virtually non-existent. The pragmatic and responsible student of 11. American Power and the Enu Mandarins. Contemporary affairs does not descend to such emotionalism. In March 1968, the Boston Globe ran a series of letters from a member of the International Voluntary Services, a teacher in a M. Montagnet village, obviously a person of great courage and dedication. For the most part, these were nice, chatty letters about life in Vietnam and the good things we're doing for those poor people over there. Here are some selections from one letter. Funny thing about Vietnam, we're creating these secure islands, people are relocated, shuffled into pacified areas, but most of the country is a no man's land which we're rapidly turning into a desert by bombing, defoliation, etc. If the Americans get their way, it'll be a country of beaches, plus a few islands of secure areas. And the rest'll be wasteland. Funny thing to do to a country whose economy and politics you're paying to enhance. But they say the only way to beat the guerrilla forces is to eliminate their source of life, the land and the people, ruin the land and concentrate the people into areas you can protect. Dot for. I think that such a letter tells us a good deal about the mood of the country today. A member of the IVS learns that what we are trying to do is eliminate their source of life, the land and the people, and then goes on cheerily and dutifully to do her job, helping to restore what has been destroyed. More to the point, several hundred thousand citizens of Greater Boston the cultural capital of the United States. They would like to believe may have read that letter and gone on to do their jobs. Why not? It is no more harrowing than dozens of other things they have seen and read. In fact, it is doubtful whether there is anything we could do to the people of Vietnam, the communists, that is, that would cause more than a momentary shudder. 
A few weeks earlier the citizens of Boston read an article in the same place on the Globe editorial page by the chairman of 12. Introduction The Department of Government at Harvard University, in which he described the process of urbanization in South Vietnam, an interesting sociological phenomenon which opens up a whole range of new possibilities for nation building. Five, he spares us the details of how the United States is urbanizing the people of Vietnam, but others have described the process, for example, the IVS worker just quoted. Urbanization, of course, is that funny thing that we're doing to the people of Vietnam. It is the process described in the following terms by Don Luce, who resigned as director of IVS in late 1967 in protest against United States policy, after nine years in the field. Less fortunate villagers than those in pacified villages have been uprooted from their traditional homes and placed in refugee camps that crowd around the cities. These bleak camps are made up almost completely of women and children who deeply resent having been torn away from their farmlands and way of life, away from their ancestral burial grounds, and even away from their husbands who are usually with a Viet Cong. Their old village usually becomes part of a free strike zone. This means that planes can drop bombs anywhere in that area and that anyone caught there will be considered a Viet Cong and shot. Unfortunately, Many of the refugees go back to harvest their rice or wander into these areas to gather wood or thatch. In Tuiho, one of the IVS members was asked to give blood at the provincial hospital where he was working on a part-time basis. He asked an old man waiting in the hospital what had happened. The old man replied bitterly, My son and four others went to cut wood. On their return an American helicopter hovered over. Frightened, they ran. Four were wounded, one was killed. Six. In short, urbanization is the process by which you eliminate their source of life, the land and the people, ruin the land and concentrate the people into areas you can protect. This everyone understands. Yet there is scarcely a ripple of protest when the chairman of the Department of Government at our great test. 13. A M E R I can power A N D the N U M A N D A R I N S. University speaks of the sociological process of urbanization, the benefits it provides for the Vietnamese, and the possibilities it offers us to win the war. This calm and analytic attitude towards the problem of how to win the war can be illustrated with innumerable examples from the writings of responsible political analysts. To pick just one, consider some remarks by Joseph Harsh on the bombing tactics in North Vietnam. Seven Mr. Harsh discusses the frustrations of the limited bombing policy. A bomb dropped into a leafy jungle produces no visible result. Even if it hits a truck carrying ammunition the pilot seldom has the satisfaction of knowing what he achieved. A hit on a big hydroelectric dam is another matter. There is a huge explosion visible from anywhere above. The dam can be seen to fall. The waters can be seen to pour through the breach and drown out huge areas of farmland and villages in its path. The pilot who takes out a hydroelectric dam gets back home with a feeling of accomplishment. Novels are written and films are made of such exploits. The bomb which takes out the dam will flood villages, drown people, destroy crops, and knock out some electric power. Bombing the dam would hurt people. Every dam taken out would give more reason for claiming that the enemy is hurting. In theory. If he can be hurt enough his government should be more inclined to go to the conference table. Despite all of these advantages of bombing dams, Harsh apparently believes that it is more reasonable to bomb trucks. The reason is that there is no evidence that this causing of pain to civilians in North Vietnam has had the effect of persuading their government to enter into negotiations. Furthermore, the effect of terror bombing is slight in a non-industrialized country. Therefore, he suggests, 
we should not go after the spectacular targets which cause militarily dubious painted people in North Vietnam, but rather after the unspectacular targets which can. 14. Introduction. Bring some military relief to the infantrymen in the battle on the ground, even though this is a shame for the pilots who are missing out on the feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction that comes from flooding villages, drowning people, and destroying crops. By coincidence, the same newspaper published an eyewitness report of the bombing of dikes in South Vietnam, just a few days later. Eight, the correspondent reports. Dikes in the fertile Red River Delta North Vietnam's rice basket have come under increasing air attack lately. The American bombing appears intended not only to demoralize and harass the population in the most densely populated region of the country, but also to destroy the rice crops in the vast alluvial plains with their vulnerable open spaces. Here in the Delta region whose paddy fields provide the bulk of the rice supply of 1-7 million North Vietnamese, there have been almost daily attacks on dikes along the numerous small confluences of the Red River. The pattern of the bombing in the Delta seems evident to interdict agricultural production. No military targets are visible in the dikes. The heaviest artillery pieces we saw were antiquated rifles of the peasant militia. As a historical reference point, recall that German High Commissioner Seysinkwart was condemned to death at Nuremberg for opening the dikes in Holland at the time of the Allied in Versailles.9 Since the editors of the Christian Science Monitor did not feel that this disclosure required editorial comment, I do not know whether they regarded Harsh's sensible argument for the bombing of trucks rather than dams as now counterbalanced by other considerations. As a final illustration of the callousness of the American response to what the mass media reveal, consider a small item in the New York Times of March 1, 8, 1968, headed, Army Exhibit Bars Simulated Shooting at Vietnamese Hut. The item reports. 15. American Power A.N.D. The N.U. Manda R. Brian S. An attempt by the peace movement to disrupt an exhibit in the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. Beginning today, visitors can no longer enter a helicopter for simulated firing of a machine gun at targets in a diorama of the Vietnam Central Highlands. The targets were a hut, two bridges and an ammunition dump, and a light flashed when a hit was scored. Apparently. It was great fun for the kiddies until those damned peace enics turned up and started one of their interminable demonstrations, even occupying the exhibit. According to the Times report, demonstrators particularly objected to children being permitted to fire at the hut, even though no people appear there or elsewhere in the diorama, which just shows how unreasonable peace enics can be. Although it is small compensation from the closing of this entertaining exhibit, visitors, however, may still test their skills elsewhere in the exhibit by simulated firing of an anti-tank weapon and several models of rifles. What can one say about a country where a museum of science in a great city can feature an exhibit in which people fire machine guns from a helicopter at Vietnamese huts? with a light flashing when a hit is scored. What can one say about a country where such an idea can even be considered? You have to weep for this country. These and a thousand other examples testify to moral degeneration on such a scale that talk about the normal channels of political action and protest becomes meaningless or hypocrisy. California We have to ask ourselves whether what is needed in the United States is dissent or denazification. The question is a debatable one. Reasonable people may differ. The fact that the question is even debatable is a terrifying thing. To me it seems that what is needed is a kind of denitification. What is more? 16. Introduction. There is no powerful outside force that can call us to account the change will have to come from within. I have been speaking only of oppression overseas, 
but it need hardly be emphasized that there is a domestic analogue. The reaction to the suffering of oppressed minorities at home is not very different from the brutal apathy towards the misery we have imposed elsewhere in the world. Opposition to the war in Vietnam is based very largely on its cost, and on the failure of American power to crush Vietnamese resistance. It is sad, but nonetheless true, that the tiny steps to bring freedom to black Americans have been taken, for the most part. Out of fear? We must recognize these facts and regret them deeply, but not be paralyzed by this recognition. Anger, outrage, confessions of overwhelming guilt may be good therapy. They can also become a barrier to effective action, which can always be made to seem incommensurable with the enormity of the crime. Nothing is easier than to adopt a new form of self-indulgence no less debilitating than the old apathy. The danger is substantial. It is hardly a novel insight that confession of guilt can be institutionalized as a technique for evading what must be done. It is even possible to achieve a feeling of satisfaction by contemplating one's evil nature. No less insidious is the cry for revolution, at a time when not even the germs of new institutions exist let alone the moral and political consciousness that could lead to a basic modification of social life. If there will be a revelation in America today, it will no doubt be a move towards some variety of fascism. We must guard against the kind of revolutionary rhetoric that would have had Karl Marx burnt down the British Museum because it was merely part of a repressive society. It would be criminal to overlook the serious flaws and inadequacies in our institutions, or to fail to utilize. 11. A M E R I California N P O W E R A N D T H E N U M A N D A R I N S. The substantial degree of freedom that most of us enjoy, within the framework of these flawed institutions, to modify them or even replace them by a better social order. One who pays some attention to history will not be surprised if those who cry most loudly that we must smash and destroy are later found among the administrators of some new system of repression. Someday the war in Vietnam will end, and with it the renewed impulse it has given to self-analysis and the search for cause and alternatives. Those who were opposed to the war merely because of its costs or its atrocities will fall away. It is possible that an American defeat that cannot be disguised, or a victory that opens the way to new savagery, will be accompanied by a serious domestic repression that will leave little energy or will for the task of re-evaluation and reconstruction of ideology and social life. But there are also encouraging signs. There is a growing realization that it is an illusion to believe that all will be well if only today's liberal hero can be placed in the White House, and a growing awareness that isolated, competing individuals can rarely confront repressive institutions alone. At best, a few may be tolerated as intellectual gadflies. The mass, even under formal democracy, will accept the values that have been inculcated often accidentally and often deliberately by vested interests, values that have the status of unconsciously acquired habits rather than choices. 10. In a fragmented, competitive society, individuals can neither discover their true interests nor act to defend them, as they cannot do so when prevented from free association by totalitarian controls. Recognition of these facts has brought young men together in various forms of resistance and has given rise to the little-known but very impressive attempts at community organizing in many parts of the country. It also apparently motivates many of the spokesmen for black power. It is interesting. 18. Introduction to see how classical ideas of libertarian socialism have found their way into the ideology of the new left. Such statements as the following have become near cliches not therefore false or unimportant. Our social system has sacrificed the general interests of human society to the private interests of individuals, and thus systematically undermined a true relationship between men 
democracy with its motto of equality of all citizens before the law and liberalism with its right of man over his own person both were wrecked on the realities of capitalist economy. The greatest evil of any form of power is just that it always tries to force the rich diversity of social life into definite forms and adjust it to particular norms. Political rights do not originate in parliaments, they are rather forced upon them from without. And even their enactment into law has for a long time been no guarantee of their security. They do not exist because they have been legally sat down on a piece of paper, but only when they have become the ingrown habit of a people, and when any attempt to impair them will meet with the violent resistance of the populace. Where this is not the case, there is no help in any parliamentary opposition or any platonic appeals to the constitution. One compels respect from others when one knows how to defend one's dignity as a human being. This is not only true in private life, it has always been the same in political life as well. 11. To me it seems that the revival of anarchist thinking in the new left and the attempts to put it into effect are the most promising development of the past years, and that if this development can solidify, it offers some real hope that the present American crisis will not become an American and world cutters trophy. In the decade of indifference, Albert Einstein once described the importance of the War Resisters League in these terms. 19. A. M. E. R. I. Can power A. N. D. T. H. E. N. New Man R. I. N. S. Dot. By union, it relieves courageous and resolute individuals of the paralyzing feeling of isolation and loneliness, and in this way gives them moral support in the fulfillment of what they consider to be their duty. The existence of such a moral elite is indispensable for the preparation of a fundamental change in public opinion, a change which, under present-day circumstances, is absolutely necessary if humanity is to survive. 12. In the past few years the moral elite has grown to a considerable force among the young, and is searching for ways to unite and to act both as a political and a moral force. It remains to be seen whether this can become a creative and self-sustaining tradition, not dependent on exterior events for its survival, and whether it can unite with other forces for constructive change. If it can do so, we may be able to come to grips with the problems that plague us. We may also be able to avoid a fate that was according to an often quoted story outlined by Einstein on another occasion. When he was asked what sort of weapons might be used in a possible third world war, his answer was that he did not know what weapons would be used in World War III, but he was sure that the Fourth World War would be fought with stones and clubs. Notes 1. Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., The Bitter Heritage, Vietnam and American Democracy, Boston, Houghton Mifnuf Company. 1 967 p. 34. 2. Twilight of Idols, in the world of Randolph Bourne, ed. Lillian Schlissel, New York, E. P. Dutton and Go, Incorporated, 1965, pages 198 to 99. 3. Ibid, p. 202. 4. Boston Globe. March 13, 1968. 5. Samuel P. Huntington, Why the Viet Cong Attacked the Cities, Boston Globe, February 17, 1968. See page 42 below for some quotations. 20. Introduction. Professor Huntington has since expanded on these thoughts in the basis of accommodation, Foreign Affairs, Volume 46, Number 4. July 1968, pages 642 to 56. He explains that the Viet Cong is a powerful force which cannot be dislodged from its constituency so long as the constituency continues to exist. Evidently, we must therefore ensure that the constituency the rural population ceases to exist. A Himmler or a Streicher would have advanced one obvious solution. This liberal social scientist, however, 
suggests another that we drive the peasants into the cities by force. Urbanization, putting off and to laugh to the war the massive government programs that will be required either to resettle migrants in rural areas or to rebuild the cities and promote peacetime urban employment. This policy may prove to be the answer to wars of national liberation, an answer that we have stumbled upon in Vietnam, in an absent-minded way. Professor Huntington disputes the view of Sir Robert Thompson that peasant-based insurgency is immune to the direct application of mechanical and conventional power. Not so, in the light of recent events, this statement needs to be seriously qualified. For if the direct application of mechanical and conventional power takes place on such a massive scale as to produce a massive migration from countryside to city, the basic assumptions underlying the Maoist doctrine of revolutionary war no longer operate. The Maoist-inspired rural revolution is undercut by the American-sponsored urban revolution. It is helpful to have this explanation from a leading political scientist of the basic assumptions underlying the American doctrine of counter-revolutionary war. 6. The Making of a Dove, The Progressive, 1968, distributed by Vietnam Information Project, 100 Maryland Avenue North. E, Washington, D.C. 2002. This project consists of a group of returned IVS workers who are trying to bring to the attention of the American people some of the facts about what is happening in the villages of Vietnam. They are, in fact, the only Americans who have significant first-hand information about this matter. They are to be contrasted with the visiting political scientists who seem to believe that interviews with captured prisoners or defectors give a fair account of attitudes in rural Vietnam. It is worth mentioning that the IVS workers were, as a group, more or less committed to the American effort, and even after resigning in protest against what they had seen, did not question our 21. American Power and T. H. E. Newmander R. Brian S. Right to restructure Vietnamese society along lines that appear to us appropriate. See page 251 below. 7. Drug vs. Dam, Christian Science Monitor, September 5, verse 967. To the reader who suspects that this is irony, I can only propose that he read the article in full. 8. Amando Doronle, Hanoi Food Output Held Target of U.S. Bombers, App, Christian Science Monitor, September 8, 1967. 9. See the memorandum by Gabriel Colco to the Russell Tribunal, quoted in Liberation, Volume 12, May to June 1967, p. 13. I snow PR regarded this despicable act as a blot on the military honor of the German commander and warned that he and his cohorts would be considered violators of the laws of war who must face the certain consequences of their acts. 1 0. C. Wright Mills, The Sociological Imagination, New York, Oxford University Press, 1959, p. 194. 11. All quotes from Rudolf Racker. Anarchism and Anarcho Syndicalism, and Paul Eltzbaker, ed. Anarchism, London, Freedom Press, 1 960, pp. 2 568. Equally characteristic of new left thinking is the judgment that Rocker quotes from Kropotkin regarding Bolshevik Russia. Russia has shown us the way in which socialism cannot be realized. The idea of workers' councils from the control of the political and economic life of the country is, in itself, of extraordinary importance. But so long as the country is dominated by the dictatorship of a party, the workers' and peasants' councils naturally lose their significance. They are degraded to the same passive role which the representatives of the estates used to play in the time of the absolute monarchy. Rocker himself comments that the dictatorship 
of the proletariat paved the way not for a socialist society but for the most primitive type of bureaucratic state capitalism and a reversion to political absolutism which was long ago abolished in most countries by bourgeois revolutions. 1-2. Address at e. Princeton, N.J., August 1, 0, 1953. Cited Diane John H. Benzel. Antipolitics in America, New York, Alfred A. Nope, Incorporated, 196 7, p. 166. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship. In a recent essay, Connor Cruz O'Brien speaks of the process of counter revolutionary subordination which poses a threat to scholarly integrity in our own counter revolutionary society. Just as revolutionary subordination, a phenomenon often noted and rightly deplored, has undermined scholarly integrity in revolutionary and post-evolutionary situations. When he observes that power in our time has more intelligence in its service, and allows that intelligence more discretion as to its methods, than ever before in history, and suggests that this development is not altogether encouraging since we have moved perceptibly towards the state of the society main through the systematic. Parts of this essay were delivered as a lecture of New York University in March 1, 1968, as part of the Albert Schweitzer lecture series, and will appear in Power and Consciousness in Society, edited by Connor Cruz O'Brien and published by New York University Press. I am indebted to Paul Potter. Andre Sifrin, and Willilam Watson for very helpful comments. 23. American Power and the Enumander R. Brian S. Corruption of its intelligence. He urges that increased and specific vigilance, not just the elaboration of general principles, is required from the intellectual community towards specific growing dangers to its integrity. Senator Fulbright has developed a similar theme in an important and perceptive speech. Too, he describes the failure of the universities to form an effective counterweight to the military industrial complex by strengthening their emphasis on the traditional values of our democracy. Instead, they have joined the monolith, adding greatly to its power and influence. Specifically, he refers to the failure of the social scientists who ought to be acting as responsible and independent critics of the government's policies, but who instead become the agents of these policies. While young dissenters plead for resurrection of the American promise, the elders continue to subvert it. With the surrender of independence, the neglect of teaching, and the distortion of scholarship, the university is not only failing to meet its responsibilities to its students, it is betraying a public trust. The extent of this betrayal might be argued. Its existence, as a threatening tendency, is hardly in doubt. Senator Fulbright mentions one primary cause, the access to money and influence. Others might be mentioned, for example, a highly restrictive, almost universally shared ideology, and the inherent dynamics of professionalization. As to the former, Fulbright has cited elsewhere the observation of de Tocqueville, I know of no country in which there is so little independence of mind and real freedom when H of discussion as in America. Free institutions certainly exist, but a tradition of passivity and conformism restricts their use. The cynic might say this is why they continue to exist. The impact of professionalization is also quite clear. The free-floating intellectual may occupy himself with problems b. 24. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. Cause of their inherent interest and importance, perhaps to little effect. The professional, however, tends to define his problems on the basis of the technique that he has mastered, and has a natural desire to apply his skills. Commenting on this process. Senator Clark quotes the remarks of Dr. Harold Agnew, director of the Los Alamos Laboratories Weapons Division, 
The basis of advanced technology is innovation and nothing is more stifling to innovation than seeing one's product not used or ruled out of consideration on flimsy premises involving public world opinion. 3. A shocking statement and a dangerous one, as Clark rightly comments. In much the same way, behavioral scientists who believe themselves to be in possession of certain techniques of control and manipulation will tend to search for problems to which their knowledge and skills might be relevant, defining these as the important problems, and it will come as no surprise that they occasionally express their contempt for flimsy premises involving public world opinion that restrict the application of these skills. Thus among engineers, there are the weapons cultists who construct their bombs and missiles, and among the behavioral scientists, we find the technicians who design and carry out experiments with population and resources control methods in Vietnam. For these various factors access to power, shared ideology, professionalization may or may not be deplorable in themselves. But there can be no doubt that they interact so as to pose a serious threat to the integrity of scholarship in fields that are struggling for intellectual content and are thus particularly susceptible to the workings of a kind of Gresham's law. What is more, the subversion of scholarship poses a threat to society at large. The danger is particularly great in a society that encourages specialization and stands in awe of technical expertise. In such circumstances, the opportunities are great for the abuse of. 25. A. M. E. R. I. California N. P. O. V. R. A. N. D. T. H. E. N. U. M. A. N. D. A. R. I. N. S. Knowledge and technique to be more exact, the claim to knowledge and technique. Taking note of these dangers, one reads with concern the claims of some social scientists that their discipline is essential for the training of those to whom they refer as the mandrains of the future. Six philosophy and literature still have their value, so Ethel Paul informs us that it is psychology, sociology, systems analysis and political science that provide the knowledge by which men of power are humanized and civilized. In no small measure, the Vietnam War was designed and executed by these new mandarins, and it testifies to the concept of humanity and civilization they are likely to bring to the exercise of power. Six is the new access to power of the technical intelligentsia a delusion or a growing reality? There are those who perceive the societal structure of a new society in which the leadership will rest with the research corporation the industrial laboratories, the experimental stations, and the universities, with the scientists, the mathematicians, the economists, and the engineers of the new computer technology, not only the best talents, but eventually the entire complex of social prestige and social status, will be rooted in the intellectual and scientific communities. Seven, a careful look at the skeletal structure of this new society, if such it is, is hardly reassuring. As Daniel Bell points out, it has been war rather than peace that has been largely responsible for the acceptance of planning and technocratic modes in government, and our present mobilized society is one that is geared to the social goal of military and war preparedness. Bell's relative optimism regarding the new society comes from his assumption that the university is the place where theoretical knowledge is sought, tested, and codified in a disinterested way and that the mobilized postures of the Cold War and the space race are a temporary aberration, a reaction. 26. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship To Communist Aggressiveness In contrast, a strong argument can be made that the university has, to a significant degree, betrayed its public trust, that matters of foreign policy are very much a reflex of internal political forces as well as of economic institutions, rather than a judgment about the national interest, involving strategy decisions based on the calculations of an opponent's strength and intentions that the mobilization for war is not irony but a natural development, given our present social and economic organization, 
that the technologists who achieve power are those who can perform a service for existing institutions, and that nothing but catastrophe is to be expected from still further centralization of a decision-making in government and a narrowing base of corporate affiliates. The experience of the past few years gives little reason to feel optimistic about these developments. Quite generally, what grounds are there for supposing that those whose claim to power is based on knowledge and technique will be more benign in their exercise of power than those whose claim is based on wealth or aristocratic origin? On the contrary, one might expect the new Mandarin to be dangerously arrogant, aggressive, and incapable of adjusting to failure, as compared with his predecessor whose claim to power was not diminished by honesty as to the limitations of his knowledge, lack of work to do, or demonstrable mistakes. Eight. In the Vietnam catastrophe, all of these factors are detectable. There is no point in overgeneralizing, but neither history nor psychology nor sociology gives us any particular reason to look forward with hope to the rule of the new mandarins. In general, one would expect any group with access to power and affluence to construct an ideology that will justify this state middle dot of affairs on grounds of the general welfare. For just this reason, Bell's thesis that intellectuals are moving closer to the center of N. American power and the Enumander are Ryan's power or at least being absorbed more fully into the decision-making structure, is to some extent supported by the phenomenon of counter-revolutionary subordination noted earlier. That is, one might anticipate that as power becomes more accessible, the inequities of the society will recede from vision, the status quo will seem less flawed, and the preservation of order will become a matter of transcendent importance. The fact is that American intellectuals are increasingly achieving the status of a doubly privileged elite, first, as American citizens, with respect to the rest of the world, and second, because of their role in American society, which is surely quite central, whether or not Bell's prediction proves accurate. In a such a situation, the dangers of counter-revolutionary subordination, in both the domestic and the international arena, are apparent. I think that O'Brien is entirely correct in pointing to the necessity for increased and specific vigilance towards the danger of counter-revolutionary subordination, of which, as he correctly remarks, we hear almost nothing. I would like to devote this essay to a number of examples. Several years ago it was enthusiastically proclaimed that the fundamental political problems of the Industrial Revolution have been solved, and that this very triumph of democratic social evolution in the West ends domestic politics for those intellectuals who must have ideologies or utopias to motivate them to social action. 9. During this period of faith in the end of ideology even enlightened and informed commentators were inclined to present the most remarkable evaluations of the state of American society. Daniel Bell, for example, wrote that in the mass consumption economy all groups can easily acquire the outward badges of status and erase the visible demarcations. 10 Writing in Commentary in October 1st 964, he may. 28 objectivity and liberal scholarship. Tained that we have in effect already achieved the egalitarian and socially mobile society which the free-floating intellectuals associated with the Marxist tradition have been calling for during the last hundred years. Granting the obvious general rise in standard of living, the judgment of Gunnar Middle seems far more appropriate to the actual situation when he says, the common idea that America is an immensely rich and affluent country is very much an exaggeration. American affluence is heavily mortgaged. America carries a tremendous burden of debt to its poor people. That this debt must be paid is not only a wish of the do-gooders. Not paying it implies a risk for the social order and for democracy as we have known it. 
11. Surely the claim that all groups can easily enter the mass consumption economy and erase the visible demarcations is a considerable exaggeration. Similar evaluations of American society appear frequently in contemporary scholarship. To mention just one example, consider the analysis that Adam Alam gives of Marx's concept of capitalism. One cannot blame a contemporary observer like Marx for his conviction that industrial fanaticism and self-righteousness were indelible traits of the capitalist. That the capitalist would grow more humane, that he would slacken in his ceaseless pursuit of accumulation and expansion, were not impressions readily warranted by the English social scene of the 1840s and so's. 12 again. Granting the important changes in industrial society over the past century, it still comes as a surprise to hear that the capitalist has slackened in his ceaseless pursuit of accumulation and expansion. 13. Remarks such as these illustrate a failure to come to grips with the reality of contemporary society which may not be directly traceable to the newly found, or at least hopefully sought access to power and affluence, but which is, neither the 29. American power and the Enumanda are Brian's. Less, what one would expect in the developing ideology of a new privilege delete. Various strands of this ideology are drawn together in a recent article by Zbigniew Brzezinski, 14 in which a number of the conceptions and attitudes that appear in recent social thought are summarized I am tempted to say parodied. Brzezinski too sees a profound change taking place in the intellectual community, as the largely humanist-oriented, occasionally ideologically-minded intellectual dissenter who sees his role largely in terms of proffering social critiques, is rapidly being displaced either by experts and specialists, who become involved in special governmental undertakings, or by the generalists middle dot integrators, who become in effect house ideologues for those in power, providing overall intellectual integration for disparate actions. He suggests that these organization oriented Application-minded intellectuals can be expected to introduce broader and more relevant concerns into the political system though there is, as he notes, a danger that intellectual detachment and the disinterested search for truth will come to an end, given the new axis of the application-minded intellectuals to power, prestige, and the good life. They are a new meritocratic elite, taking over American life utilizing the universities, exploiting the latest techniques of communications, harnessing as rapidly as possible the most recent technological devices. Presumably, their civilizing impact is revealed by the great progress that has been made, in this new historical era that America alone has already entered, with respect to the problems that confounded the bumbling political leaders of past eras the problems of the cities of pollution, of waste and destructiveness, of exploitation and poverty. Under the leadership of this new breed of politicians intellectuals, America has become the creative society, the others, consciously and unconsciously, are. 30. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. Imulative. We see this, for example, in mathematics, the biological sciences, anthropology philosophy, cinema, music, historical scholarship, and so on, where other cultures, hopelessly outdistanced, merely observe and imitate what America creates. Thus we move towards a new worldwide superculture, strongly influenced by American life, with its own universal electronic computer language, with an enormous and growing psychocultural gap separating America from the rest of the developed world. It is impossible even to imagine what Brzezinski thinks a universal electronic middle dot computer language may be, or what cultural values he thinks will be created by the new technologi called dominant unconditioned technotron who, he apparently believes, may prove to be the true repository of that indefinable quality we call human. 
It would hardly be rewarding to try to disentangle Brzezinski's confusions and misunderstandings. What is interesting, rather, is the way his dim awareness of current developments in science and technology is used to provide an ideological justification for the increasing role in the key decision-making institutions of individuals with special intellectual and scientific attainments, the new organization-oriented, application-minded intellectuals based in the university, the creative eye of the massive communications complex. Parallel to the assumption that all is basically well at home is the widely articulated belief that the problems of international society, too, would be subject to intelligent management were it not for the machinations of the communists. One aspect of this complacence is the belief that the Cold War was entirely the result of Russian, later Chinese, aggressiveness. For example, Daniel Bell has described the origins of the Cold War in the following terms, when the Russians began stirring up the Greek guerrilla Iam in what had been tacitly acknowledged at. 31. American Power and the New Manda are Ryanness. Tehran as a British sphere of influence, the communists began their cry against Anglo-American imperialism. Following the rejection of the Marshall Plan and the communist coup in Czechoslovakia in February 1, 948, the Cold War was on in earnest. 15. Clearly, this will hardly do as a balanced and objective statement of the origins of the Cold War, but the distortion it reflects is an inherent element in Bell's optimism about the new society since it enables him to maintain that our Cold War posture is purely reactive, and that once communist belligerence is tamed, the new technical intelligentsia can turn its attention to the construction of a more decent society. A related element in the ideology of the liberal intellectual is the firm belief in the fundamental generosity of Western policy towards the Third World. Adam Malamagan provides a typical example, problems of an international society undergoing an economic and ideological revelation seem to defy. The generosity granted its qualifications and errors that has characterized the policy of the leading democratic powers of the West. 16. Even Hans Morgenf succumbs to this illusion. He summarizes a discussion of intervention with these remarks. We have intervened in the political, military and economic affairs of other countries to the tune of far in excess of $1.00 billion, and we are at present involved in a costly and risky war in order to build a nation in South Vietnam. Only the enemies of the United States will question the generosity of these efforts, which have no parallel in history. 17. Whatever one may think about the $100 billion, it is difficult to see why anyone should take seriously the professed generosity of our effort to build a nation in South Vietnam, any more than the similar professions of benevolence by our many forerunners in such enterprises. Generosity has never been a commodity in short supply among powers bent on extending their hegemony. 32. Zero Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Still another strand in the ideology of the new emerging elite is the concern for order, for maintaining the status quo, which is now seen to be quite favorable and essentially just. An excellent example is the statement by 14 leading political scientists and historians on United States Asian policy, recently distributed by the Freedom House Public Affairs Institute. 18 these scholars designate themselves as the moderate segment of the academic community. The designation is accurate. They stand midway between the two varieties of extremism, one which demands that we destroy everyone who stands in our path. The other, that we adopt the principles of international behavior we require of every other world power. The purpose of their statement is to challenge those among us who, overwhelmed by guilt complexes, find comfort in asserting or implying that we are always wrong, our critics always right, and that only doom lies ahead. They find a record in Asia to be remarkably good and applaud our demonstrated ability to rectify mistakes, 
our capacity for pragmatism and self-examination, and our healthy avoidance of narrow nationalism, capacities which distinguish us among the major societies of this era. The moderate scholars warned that to avoid a major war in the Asia-Pacific region, it is essential that the United States continue to deter, restrain, and counterbalance Chinese power. True, China has exercised great prudence in avoiding a direct confrontation with the United States or the Soviet Union since the Korean War, and it is likely that China will continue to substitute words for acts while concentrating upon domestic issues. Still, we cannot be certain of this and must therefore continue our efforts to tame the dragon. One of the gravest problems posed by China is its policy of isolationist fanaticism, obviously, a serious threat to peace. Another danger is there. 33. American Power and T.H.E.N. Umanda R. Ryan's Terrifying figure of Mao Tse Tung, a romantic who refuses to accept the bureaucratism essential to the ordering of this enormously complex, extremely difficult society. The moderate scholars would feel much more at ease with the familiar sort of technical expert, who is committed to the triumph of bureaucratism and who refrains from romantic efforts to undermine the party apparatus and the discipline it imposes. Furthermore, the moderate scholars announced their support for our basic position in Vietnam. A communist victory in Vietnam, they argue, would gravely jeopardize the possibilities for a political equilibrium in Asia, seriously damage our credibility, deeply affect the morale and the policies of our Asian allies and the neutrals. By a political equilibrium, they do not, of course refer to the status quo as of 19451946 or as outlined by international agreement at Geneva in 1954. They do not explain why the credibility of the United States is more important than the credibility of the indigenous elements in Vietnam who have dedicated themselves to war of national liberation. Nor do they explain why the morale of the military dictatorships of Thailand and Taiwan must be preserved. They merely hint darkly of the dangers of a third world war, dangers which are real enough and which are increased when advocates of revolutionary change face an external counter-revolutionary force. In principle, such dangers can be lessened by damping revolutionary ardor or by withdrawing the counter-revolutionary force. The latter alternative, however, is unthinkable, irresponsible. The crucial assumption in the program of the moderate scholars is that we must not encourage those elements committed to the thesis that violence is the best means of effecting change. It is important to recognize that it is not violence as such to which the moderate scholars object. On the contrary. 34. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. They approve of the violence in Vietnam, which, as they are well aware, enormously exceeds that of the Vietnamese enemy. To further underline this point, they cite as our greatest triumph in Southeast Asia the dramatic changes which have taken place in Indonesia, the most dramatic being the mass massacre of several hundred thousand people. But this massacre, like our extermination of Vietnamese, is not a ruse of violence to effect social change and is therefore legitimate. What is more, it may be that those massacred were largely ethnic Chinese and Lantes peasants, and that the counter-coup in effect re-established traditional authority more firmly. 19 If so, all the more reason why we should not deplore this use of violence, and in fact, the moderate scholars delicately refrain from alluding to it in the discussion of dramatic changes in Indonesia. We must conclude that when these scholars deplore the use of violence to effect change, it is not the violence but rather steps towards social change that they find truly disturbing. Social change that departs from the course we plot is not to be tolerated. The threat to order is too great. So great is the importance of stability and order that even reform of the sort that receives American authorization must often be delayed, the moderate scholars emphasize. Indeed, 
many types of reform increase instability, however desirable and essential they may be in long-range terms. For people under siege, there is no substitute for security. The reference, needless to say, is not to security from American bombardment, but rather to security from the wrong sorts of political and social change. The policy recommendations of the moderate scholars are based on their particular ideological bias, namely, that a certain form of stability not that of North Vietnam or North Korea, but that of Thailand, Taiwan, or the Philippines is so essential. 35. A M E R I California and Power A N D T A C N U M A N D A R R I N S. That we must be willing to use our unparalleled means of violence to ensure that it is preserved. It is instructive to see how other mentors of the new Mandarins describe the problem of order and reform. Ethel Paul formulates the central issue as follows: In the Congo, in Vietnam, in the Dominican Republic. It is clear that order depends on somehow compelling newly mobilized strata to return to a measure of passivity and defeatism from which they have recently been aroused by the process of modernization. At least temporarily, the maintenance of order requires a lowering of newly acquired aspirations and levels of political activity. 20. This is what we have learned in the past 30 years of intensive empirical study of contemporary societies. Poole is merely describing facts, not proposing policy. A corresponding version of the facts is familiar on the domestic scene. Workers threaten the public order by striking for their demands. The impatience of the Negro community threatens the stability of the body politic. One can, of course. Imagine another way in which order can be preserved in all such cases, namely, by meeting the demands, or at the very least by removing the barriers that have been placed, by force which may be latent and disguised, in the way of attempts to satisfy the newly acquired aspirations. But this might mean that the wealthy and powerful would have to sacrifice some degree of privilege and it is therefore excluded as a method for maintenance of order. Such proposals are likely to meet with little sympathy from Poole's new mandarins. From the doubly privileged position of the American scholar, the transcendent importance of order, stability, and non-violence, by the oppressed, seems entirely obvious to others. The 38. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship matter is not so simple. If we listen, we hear such voices as this, from an economist in India. It is disingenuous to invoke democracy, due process of law, non-violence, to rationalize the absence of action. For meaningful concepts under such conditions become meaningless since, in reality, they justify the relentless pervasive exploitation of the masses, at once a denial of democracy and a more sinister form of violence perpetrated on the overwhelming majority through contractual forms. 21. Moderate American scholarship does not seem capable of comprehending these simple truths. It would be wrong to leave the impression that the ideology of the liberal intelligentsia translates itself into policy as a rain of cluster bombs and napalm. In fact, the liberal experts have been dismayed by the emphasis on military means in Vietnam and have consistently argued that the key to our efforts should be social restructuring and economic assistance. Correspondingly, I think that we can perceive more clearly the attitudes that are crystallizing among the new mandarins by considering the technical studies of pacification, for example, the research monograph of William Nice Wunger, cited earlier. See note 4. The author, now a professor of political science, was senior United States civilian representative of the Agency for International Development in Kingnam Province from 1962 to 1964. As he sees the situation, the knotty problems of pacification are intricately intertwined with the issues of political development and the necessity at this time in history intimate American involvement.
First, Americans must ask some basic questions of value and obligation questions that transcend the easy legalisms of self-determination and non-intervention. These easy legalisms have little relevance to a world. 37. American Power and the New Manda R.I.N.S. In which the West is challenged by the sophisticated methodology and quasi-religious motivation of the communist insurgency. It is our duty, in the interest of democracy and freedom, to apply our expertise to these twin goals to isolate the enemy and destroy his influence and control over the rural population, and to win the peasants' willing support through effective local administration and programs of rural improvement. An underlying assumption is that insurgency ought to be defeated for the sake of human rights. Despite the remarkable achievements in economic and social development in Russia and China, the South Vietnamese peasant deserves something better and we must give it to him as we have in Latin America and the Philippines even if this requires a barn donning the easy legalisms of the past and intervening with military force. Of course, it won't be easy. The enemy has enormous advantages. For one thing, as in China, the insurgents in Vietnam have exploited the Confucian tenets of ethical rule both by their attacks on government corruption and by exemplary communist behavior and the Viet Cong inherited, after Geneva, much of the popular support and sympathies previously attached to the Viet Minh in the South. After the fall of Diem, matters became still worse, vast regions that had been under government control quickly came under the influence of the Viet Cong. By late 1964 the pacification of the Khang Nam province had become all but impossible and the worst of it is that the battle for Khang Nam was lost by the government to Viet Cong forces recruited for the most part from within the province. 22 by 1966, the Viet Cong seem so well entrenched in rural areas that only a highly imaginative and comprehensive counterinsurgency campaign, with nearly perfect execution and substantial military support, would be capable of dislodging. 38. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Such a powerful and extensive insurgent apparatus. A major difficulty we face is the progressive social and economic results shown by the Viet Cong efforts. An aid report in March 1965 explains the problem. Comparing our new life hamlets to the Viet Cong hamlets, the report comments as follows. The basic differences are that the VC hamlets are well organized, clean, economically self-supporting and have an active defense system. For example, a cottage industry in one hamlet was as large as has been previously witnessed anywhere in Kuang Thien province. New canals are being dug and pineapples are under cultivation. The VC also have a relocation program for younger families. These areas coincide with the areas just outside the planned GVN sphere of interest. Unless the use of GVN activities exhibit a more qualitative basis, sick, there is little likelihood of changing the present attitudes of the people. For example, in one area only five kilometers from the province capital, the people refused medical assistance offered by ARVN medics. However, all is not lost. Even though the Viet Cong strength in the countryside has made a quantum leap from its position of early 1962, there is a compensating factor, namely, the counterinsurgent military capability was revolutionized by substantial American troop inputs. This allows us entirely new options. For example, we can implement more effectively some of the experiments with population and resources control methods that were tried by the USOM and the National Police as early as 196-1, though with little success. Given the new possibilities for material and human resources control, we may even recapture some of the population a serious matter, given the enormous numbers of South Vietnamese citizens presently allied with the Viet Cong. For whatever reason, 
the recovery of these peasants for the national cause must be made one of the central tasks of the pacification enterprise. 39. American Power and T. A. C. N. Umanda R. Ryan S. If we are going to succeed in implementing material and human resources control, we must moderate ARV and behavior somehow. Thus, according to an aid report of February 1965, a high incident rate of stealing, robbing, raping and obtaining free meals in the rural areas has not endeared the population towards ARV and no regional forces. Nor did it improve matters when many civilians witnessed a case in which an ARV and company leader killed a draft dodger, disemboweled him, shook his heart and liver out and had them cooked at a restaurant, after which the heart and liver were eaten by a number of soldiers. Such acts cause great difficulties, especially in trying to combat an enemy so vile as to practice exemplary communist behavior. More generally, the success of pacification requires that there be survivors to be pacified, and given the sheer magnitude of American, Korean, Australian and indigenous Vietnamese forces, which has so severely strained the economic and social equilibrium of the nation, it is sometimes difficult to ensure this minimal condition. There are other problems, for example, the difficulty of denying food to the enemy in the Mekong Delta. The hunger for land ownership, which, for some curious reason, is never satisfied by our friends in Saigon, the corruption, occasional bombing of the wrong village, the pervasive Viet Cong infiltration of military and civilian government organization, the fact that when we relocate peasants to new hamlets, we often leave the fox still in the henhouse, because of inadequate police methods, and so on. Still. We have a good pacification theory, which involves three steps, elimination of the Viet Cong by search and destroy operations, protection and control of the population and its resources by police and military forces, and preparing and 40. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. Arming the peasants to defend their own communities. If we rarely reach the third stage. This is because we have not yet learned to share the sense of urgency of the revolutionary cause, or to nourish these attitudes among our Vietnamese associates. Thus we understand that the real revolution is the one we are implementing, in contrast to the artificially stimulated and controlled revolution of Diem and the communists. But we have difficulties in communicating this fact to the Vietnamese peasant or to our Vietnamese associates. What is needed, clearly, is better training for American officials, and of course, true national dedication to this humanitarian task. A grave defect in our society, this political scientist argues, is our tendency to avoid an active American role in the fostering of democratic institutions abroad. The pacification program in Vietnam represents an attempt to meet our responsibility to foster democratic institutions abroad, through rational methods of material and human resources control. Refusal to dedicate ourselves to this task might be described as a policy more selfish and timid than it was broad and enlightened. 23 To use the terminology of an earlier day. When we strip away the terminology of the behavioral sciences, we see revealed, in such work as this, the mentality of the colonial civil servant, persuaded of the benevolence of the mother country and the correctness of its vision of world order, and convinced that he understands the true interests of the backward peoples whose welfare he is to administer. In fact, much of the scholarly work on Southeast Asian affairs reflects precisely this mentality. As an example, consider the August 1967 issue of Asian Survey, fully devoted to a Vietnam symposium in which a number of experts contribute their thoughts on the success of our enterprise and how it can be moved forward. 41. A. M. E. R. Icon Power and the N. U. Manda R. Ryan S. The introductory essay by Samuel Huntington, chairman of the Department of Government at Harvard, is entitled Social Science and Vietnam. 
it emphasizes the need to develop scholarly study and understanding of Vietnam if our involvement is to succeed, and expresses his judgment that the papers in this volume demonstrate that issues and topics closely connected to policy can be presented and analyzed in scholarly and objective fashion. Huntington's own contribution to scholarly study and understanding of Vietnam includes an article in the Boston Globe, February 1st, 7, 1, 968. Here he describes the momentous changes in Vietnamese society during the past five years, specifically, the process of urbanization. This process struck directly at the strength and potential appeal of the Viet Cong. So long as the overwhelming mass of the people lived in the countryside, the VC could win the war by winning control of those people and they came very close to doing so in both 1961 and 1964. But the American-sponsored urban revolution undercut the VC rural revolution. The refugees fleeing from the rural areas found not only security but also prosperity and economic well-being. While wartime urban prosperity hurt some, the mass of the poor people benefited from it. The sources of urbanization have been described clearly many times, for example, by this American spokesman in Vietnam, there have been three choices open to the peasantry. 1. To stay where they are. 2. To move into the areas controlled by us. 3. To move off into the interior towards the middle. Vietcon. Our operations have been designed to make the first choice impossible, the second attractive, and to reduce the likelihood of anyone choosing the third to zero. 124 The benefits accruing to the newly urbanized elements have also been amply described in the press, for example, by James Doyle of There. 42. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship. Globe, February 22nd. First 968, Saigon is a rich city, the bar owners, beagles, many changes and black marketeers all making their fortunes while it lasts. It is a poor city, with hundreds of thousands of refugees crammed into thatched huts and tin roofed shacks, more than two million people shoehorned into two one square miles. O'Neill Sheehan, in a classic and often quoted article, New York Times, October 9th, first 966. A drive through Saigon demonstrates another fashion in which the social system works. Virtually all the new construction consists of luxury apartments, hotels and office buildings financed by Chinese businessmen or affluent Vietnamese with relatives or connections within the regime. The buildings are destined to be rented to Americans. Saigon's workers live, as they always have, in fetid slums on the city's outskirts. Bars and bordellos, thousands of young Vietnamese women degrading themselves as bar girls and prostitutes, gangs of hoodlums and beggars and children selling their older sisters and picking pockets have become ubiquitous features of urban life. Many have remarked on the striking difference between the way in which the press and the visiting scholar describe what they see in Vietnam. It should occasion no surprise. Each is pursuing his own graft. The reporter's job is to describe what he sees before his eyes. Many have done so with courage and even brilliance. The colonial administrator, on the other hand, is concerned to justify what he has done and what he hopes to do. And if an expert is well to construct an appropriate ideological cover, to show that we are just and righteous in what we do, and to put nagging doubts to rest. One sees moral degradation and fetid slums, the other, prosperity and well-being and if kindly old Uncle Sam occasionally flicks his ashes on someone by mistake, that is surely no reason for tantrums. Returning to the collection of scholarly and objective studies in Asian survey, the first, by Kenneth Young, president of the 43. American Power and T. H. E. Newmander R. Ryan S. Asia Society, 
describes our difficulties in transferring innovations and institutions to the Vietnamese and calls for the assistance of social scientists in overcoming these difficulties. Social scientists should, he feels, study the intricacies that effectively inhibit or transfer what the Americans, either by government policy or by the technician's action, want to introduce into the mind of a Vietnamese or into a Vietnamese organization. The problem, in short, is one of communication. For this objective scholar, there is no question of our right to transfer innovations and institutions to the Vietnamese, by force if necessary, or of our superior insight into the needed innovations or appropriate institutions. In just the same way, Lord Cornwallis understood the necessity of transferring the institution of a square archie to India as any reasonable person could see, this was the only civilized form of social organization. The scholarly objectivity that Huntington lords is further demonstrated in the contribution by Milton Sachs, entitled Restructuring Government in South Vietnam. As Sachs perceives the situation, there are two forces in South Vietnam, the nationalists and the communists. The communists are the Viet Minh and the NLF. Among the nationalists, he mentions specifically the VNQDD and the Die Viet, and the military. The nationalists have a few problems, for example, they were manipulated by the French, by the Japanese, by the communists and latterly by the Americans and too many of South Vietnam's leading generals fought with the French against the Vietnamese people. 25. Our problem is the weakness of the nationalists, although there was some hope during General Khan's government, a most interesting effort because it was a genuine coalition of representatives of all the major political groups in South Vietnam. Curiously, this highly representative government was unable to accept or even to consider a pro. 44. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Proposal for what appeared to be an authentic coalition government coming from the National Liberation Front in mid-1964.26 According to Douglas Pike, the proposal could not be seriously considered because none of the non-communists in South Vietnam, with the possible exception of the Buddhists, thought themselves equal in size and power to risk entering into a coalition, fearing that if they did the whale would swallow the minnow. Thus, he continues, coalition government with a strong NLF could not be sold within South Vietnam, even to the government which, as Sachs informs us, was a genuine coalition of all the major political groups in South Vietnam. Rather, the GVN and its successors continued to insist that the NLF show their sincerity by withdrawing their armed units and their political cadres from South Vietnamese territory, March 1, 1965. According to Sachs, the problem which presents itself is to devise an institutional arrangement that will tend to counteract the factors and forces which are conducive to that instability that now plagues Vietnamese political life. This problem, of course, is one that presents itself to us. And, Sachs feels, it is well on its way to solution, with the new constitution and the forthcoming, September 196 7, elections, which will provide spokesmen who claim legitimacy through popular mandate and speak with authority on the issues of war and peace for their constituency. Although this free election, will still leave unrepresented those who are fighting under the banner of the South Vietnam National Liberation Front and those whose candidates were not permitted to stand in the elections, we must, after all, understand that no institution in the real world can be perfect. The important thing, according to Sachs, is that for the first time since the fall of Diem, there will be elections that are not seen by the government in power simply as a 45. A.M.E.R. I can power A.N.D.T.H.E.N. Umanda R.I.N.S. Means of legitimating the power they already had, using the governmental machinery to underwrite themselves. Putting aside the remarkable naivety regarding the forthcoming elections, 
What is striking is the implicit assumption that we have a right to continue our efforts to restructure the South Vietnamese government in the interests of what we determine to be Vietnamese nationalism. In just the same way, the officers of the Quantang Army sought to support genuine Manchurian nationalism 35 years ago. To understand more fully what is implied by the judgment that we must defend the nationalists against the communists, we can turn again to Peake's interesting study. The nationalist groups mentioned by Sachs are the VNQDD and the Die Viet. The former, after its virtual destruction by the French, was revived by the Chinese nationalists in 1942. It supported itself through banditry. It executed traitors with a great deal of publicity, and its violent acts in general were carefully conceived for their psychological value. Returning to Vietnam with the occupying Chinese forces following World War II, it was of some importance until mid-1946, when it was purged by the Viet Minh. The VNQDD never was a mass political party in the Western sense. At its peak of influence it numbered, by estimates of its own leaders, less than one, five hundred persons. Nor was it ever particularly strong in either Central or South Vietnam. It had no formal structure and held no conventions or assemblies. As to the Dai Viet, Dai Viet membership included leading Vietnamese figures and governmental officials who viewed Japan as a suitable model for Vietnam. N b. Fascist Japan. The organization never made any particular obeisance either to democracy or to the rank-and-file Vietnamese. It probably never numbered more than one o o o members and did not consider itself a mass-based organization. It turned away from underscore. 48. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship. Western Liberalism. Although its economic orientation was basically socialist, in favor of authoritarianism and blind obedience. During World War II, it was at all times strongly pro-Japanese. In contrast to these genuine nationalists, we have the Viet Minh, whose war was anti-colonial, clearly nationalistic, and concerned all Vietnamese, and the NLF which regarded the rural Vietnamese not simply as a pawn in a power struggle but as the active element in the thrust, which maintained that its contest with the GVN and the United States should be fought out at a political level and that the use of mass military might was in itself illegitimate, until forced by the Americans and the GVN to use counterforce to survive. In its internal documents as well as its public pronouncements the NLF insisted, from its earliest days, that its goal must be to set up a democratic national coalition administration in South Vietnam, realize independence, democratic freedoms, and improvement of the people's living conditions, safeguard peace, and achieve national reunification on the basis of independence and democracy. Aside from the NLF there has never been a truly mass-based political party in South Vietnam. It organized the rural population through the instrument of self-control victory by means of the organization weapon, setting up a variety of self-help functional liberation associations based on social discipline coupled with the right of freedom of discourse scion and secret vote at association meetings and generating a sense of community, first, by developing a pattern of political thought and behavior appropriate to the social problems of the rural Vietnamese village in the midst of sharp social change and, second, by providing a basis for group action that allowed the individual villager to see that his own efforts could have meaning and effect, obviously, a skilled and treacherous. 47. American Power and the Enumander R.I.N.S. Enemy. This was, of course, prior to the advent of massive American aid, and the GVN's strategic Hamlet program. With the American takeover of the war, the emphasis shifted to military rather than political action, and ultimately, North Vietnamese involvement and perhaps control, beginning in 1965 
large numbers of regular army troops from North Vietnam were sent into South Vietnam. In short, what we see is a contrast between the Dai Viet and Vien Cu DD, representing South Vietnamese nationalism, and the NLF, an extrinsic alien force. One must bear in mind that Sachs would undoubtedly accept Pike's factual description as a securate, but, like Pike, would regard it as demonstrating nothing, since we are the ultimate arbiters of what counts as genuine Vietnamese nationalism. An interesting counterpoint to Sachs's exposition of nationalist versus communist forces is provided in David Werfel's careful analysis, in the same issue of Asian Survey, of the Saigon political elite. He argues that this elite has not substantially changed its character in the last few years, that is, since 1962, through the maybe a few modifications, formerly, only among the great landlords were those who held significant amounts of both political and economic power, grandiose corruption may have allowed others to attain that distinction in recent years. Continuing, the military men in post-DM carbinets all served under Baudet in the French in a civil or military capacity. Under the French. Those who felt most comfortable about entering the civil service were those whose families were already part of the bureaucratic intellectual elite. By the early 1900s they saw radicalism, in the form of the Viet Minh, as a threat to their own position. The present political elite is the legacy of these developments. Although, he observes, things might change, the South Vietnamese cabinets. 48. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. And perhaps most of the rest of the political elite have been constituted by a highly westernized intelligentsia. Though the people of South Vietnam seem to be in a revolutionary mood, this elite is hardly revolutionary. The NLF constitutes a counter elite, less westernized, of the NLF Central Committee members, only three out of 27 reports studying in France. The problem of restructuring government is further analyzed by Ethel Poole, along lines that parallel Sachs's contribution to this collection of scholarly, objective studies. He begins by formulating a general proposition, I rule out of consideration here a large range of viable political settlements, namely, those that involve the inclusion of the Viet Cong in a coalition government or even the persistence of the Viet Cong as a legal organization in South Vietnam. Such arrangements are not acceptable to us, that is. The only acceptable settlement is one imposed by the GVN despite the persisting great political power of the Viet Cong. There is, of course, a certain difficulty. The Viet Cong is too strong to be simply beaten or suppressed. It follows, then, that we must provide inducements to the Viet Cong activists to join our enterprise. This should not prove too difficult, he feels. The Viet Cong leadership consists basically of bureaucratic types who are on the make. Cognitive dissonance theory suggests that this discontented leadership has the potential for making a total break when the going gets too rough. We must therefore provide them with a political rationalization for changing sides. The problem is ideological. We must induce a change in the image of reality of the Viet Cong cadres, replacing their naive ideology which sees the GVN as American puppets and supporters of exploiters, the tax collectors, the merchants, the big landlords, the police, and the evil men in the villages, by a more realistic conception. We can do this by emphasizing. 49. American power and T. H. E. N. Umanda R. Brian S. Hamlet Home Rule and Preventing the Use of Military Forces to Collect Rents a suggestion which will be greeted with enthusiasm in Saigon, no doubt. The opportunity to serve as functionaries for a central government which pursues such policies will attract the Viet Cong cadres and thus solve a problem, that of excluding from the political process the organization that contains the effective political leaders. 
Others have expressed a rather different evaluation of the human quality and motivation of these cadres. For example, Joseph Bettingdue contrasts the inability of the DiEM regime to mobilize support with the success of the NLF, that people willing to serve their country were to be found in Vietnam no one could doubt. The Viet Minh had been able to enlist them by the tens of thousands and to extract from them superhuman efforts and sacrifices in the struggle for independence. Twenty-seven military reports by the dozens relate the amazing heroism and dedication of the guerrillas. Throughout history, however, colonial administrators have had their difficulties in comprehending or coming to grips with this phenomenon. In the course of his analysis of our dilemma in Vietnam, Poole explains some of the aspects of our culture that make it difficult for us to understand such matters clearly. We live in a guilt culture in which there is a tradition of belief in equality. For such reasons, we find it hard to understand the true nature of Viet Cong land redistribution, which is primarily a patronage operation in which dissatisfied peasants band together in a gang to despoil their neighbors and then reward the deserving members of the cabal. This terminology recalls Franz Spokenau's description of the streak of moral indifference in the history of Russian revolutionism, which permitted such atrocities as the willingness to expropriate, by means of robbery, the individual property of 60. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Individual Bourgeois 28 Our Side, in contrast, adheres to the tradition of belief in equality when we implement land reform. For example, the New York Times, December 26, 1967, reports a recent conference of experts studying the Taiwan success in land reform, one of the real success stories of American intervention. The government reimbursed the former landlords in part, 30%, with shares of four large public enterprises taken over from the Japanese. The remainder was paid in bonds. Many speakers at the conference singled out the repayment as the shrewdest feature of the Taiwan program. It not only treated the landlords fairly, they said, but it also redirected the landlords' energies and capital towards industry thus advancing the wholesale restructuring of society in the only healthy and humane direction. In a side remark, Poole states that in lay public debates now going on one often hears comments to the effect that Vietnamese communism, because it is anti-Chinese, would be like Yugoslav communism. It would, of course, be ridiculous to argue such a causal connection, and, in fact, I have never heard it proposed in lay public debate or anywhere else. Rather, what has been maintained by such laymen as Hans Morgan Mittelot for General James Gavin and others is that Vietnamese communism is likely to be Tatoist, in the sense that it will strive for independence from Chinese domination. Thus, they reject the claim that by attacking Vietnamese communism we are somehow containing Chinese communism may claim implied, for example, in the statement of the Citizens Committee for Peace with Freedom in Vietnam, in which Ethel Poole, Milton Sachs, and others, speaking for the understanding, independent and responsible men and women who have consistently opposed rewarding international aggressors from Adolf Hitler to Mao Tse Tung warn that if we abandon Vietnam, then. 51. American Power and the Enumander are Ryanes. Peking and Hanoi, flushed with success, will continue their expansionist policy through many other wars of liberation. By stating the reference to Titoist tendencies. Poole avoids the difficulty of explaining how an anti-Chinese North Vietnam is serving as the agent of Hitlerian aggression from Peking, by referring to lay public debate, he hopes, I presume, to disguise the failure of argument by a claim to expertise. Returning again to the Asian Survey Vietnam Symposium, the most significant contribution is surely Edward Mitchell's discuss sign of his Rand Corporation study on the significance of land tenure in the Vietnamese insurgency. 
in a study of 26 provinces, Mitchell has discovered a significant correlation between inequality of land tenure and extent of government, read, American, control. In brief, greater inequality implies greater control. Provinces seem to be more secure when the percentage of owner-operated land is low, tenancy is high, inequality in the distribution of farms by size is great, large, formerly French-owned estates are present, and no land redistribution has taken place. To explain this phenomenon, Mitchell turns to history and behavioral psychology. As he notes, in a number of historical cases it has been the better-to-do peasant who has revolted, while his poorer brothers actively supported or passively accepted the existing order. The behavioral explanation lies in the relative docility of poorer peasants and the firm authority of landlords in the more feudal areas. The landlord can exercise considerable influence over his tenant's behavior and read highly discourage conduct inconsistent with his own interests. In an interview with the New York Times, October 15, 1967, Mitchell adds an additional explanation for the fact that the most secure areas are those that remain essentially feudal in social structure, when the feudal structure is eliminated. 52. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. There's a vacuum, and that is ideal for the Viet Cong because they've got an organization to fill the vacuum. This observation points to the difficulty that has always plagued the American effort. As Joseph Buttinger points out, the DM regime too was unable to experiment with freely constituted organizations because these would have been captured by the Viet Minh. 29. Mitchell's informative study supports an approach to counter-insurgency that has been expressed by Roger Hilsman, who explains that in his view, modernization cannot help much in a counter-guerrilla program, because it inevitably uproots established social systems, and, produces political and economic dislocation and tension. He therefore feels that popularity of governments, reform, and modernization may be important ingredients, but that their role in counterinsurgency must be measured more in terms of their contributions to physical security. 30. Before leaving this symposium on social science and Vietnam, we should take note of the scholarly detachment that permits one not to make certain comments or draw certain conclusions, for example, John Bennett discusses the important matter of geographic and job mobility, under the dual impact of improved opportunities elsewhere and deteriorating security at home, people are willing to move to a hitherto unbelievable extent. No further comment on this willingness, which provides such interesting new opportunities for the restructuring of Vietnamese society. John Donnell discusses the unusual success of pacification in Bindin province, particularly in the areas controlled by the Koreans, who have tended to run their own show with their own methods and sometimes have not allowed the road team sent from Saigon all the operational leeway desired, and who have been extremely impressive in eliminating NLF influence. Again, no comment is given on these methods. 53. American Power and the Enumanda R.I.N.S. Amply reported in the press comma 31 or on the significance of the fact that Koreans are eliminating NLF influence from Vietnamese villages, and not allowing the Vietnamese government cadre as the leeway desired. Mitchell draws no policy conclusions from his study, but authors have seen the point. Recall the remarks of the moderate scholars on the dangers of social reform. Other scholars have carried the analysis much further. For example, Charles Wolfe, senior economist of the Rand Corporation, discusses the matter in a recent book. 32 Wolfe considers two theoretical models for analyzing insurgency problems. The first is the approach of the Hearts and Minds School of Counterinsurgency which emphasizes the importance of popular support. Wolf agrees that it is no doubt a desirable goal to win popular allegiance to a government that is combating an insurgent movement, but this objective, 
he argues, is not appropriate as a conceptual framework for counterinsurgency programs. His alternative approach has as its unifying theme the concept of influencing Belzavia, rather than attitudes. Thus, confiscation of chickens, raising of houses, or destruction of villages have a place in counterinsurgency efforts, but only if they are done for a strong reason, namely, to penalize those who have assisted the insurgents. Whatever harshness is meted out by government forces, must be, unambiguously recognizable as deliberately imposed because of behavior by the population that contributes to the insurgent movement. Furthermore, it must be noted that policies that would increase rural income by raising food prices, or projects that would increase agricultural productivity through distribution of fertilizer or livestock, may be of negative value during an insurgency. Since they may actually facilitate guerrilla operations by increasing the availability of inputs that the guerrillas need. More generally, in setting up. 54. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Economic and Social Improvement Programs The crucial point is to connect such programs with the kind of population behavior the government wants to promote. The principle is to reward the villages that cooperate and to provide penalties for the behavior that the government is trying to discourage. At a broad, conceptual level, the main concern of counterinsurgency efforts should be to influence the behavior of the population rather than their loyalties and attitudes. The primary consideration should be whether the proposed measure is likely to increase the cost and difficulties of insurgent operations and help to disrupt the insurgent organization, rather than whether it wins popular loyalty and support, or whether it contributes to a more productive, efficient, or equitable use of resources. Other scholars have elaborated on the advantages of Wolf's alternative approach, which concerns itself with control of behavior rather than the mystique of popular support. For example, Morton H. Halperin, of the Harvard Center for International Affairs, writes that in Vietnam, the United States has been able to prevent any large-scale Viet Cong victories regardless of the loyalties of the people. Thus we have an empirical demonstration of a certain principle of behavioral science, as Halperin notes. The events in Vietnam also illustrate the fact that most people tend to be motivated, not by abstract appeals, but rather by their perception of the course of action that is most likely to lead to their own personal security and to the satisfaction of their economic, social, and psychological desires. Thus, for example, large-scale American bombing in South Vietnam may have antagonized a number of people, but at the same time it demonstrated to these people that the Viet Cong could not guarantee their security as it had been able to do before the bombing and that the belief in an imminent victory for the Viet Cong might turn out to be dangerously false. 38. 65. A M E R I can power A N D T H E N U M A N D A R I N S. In short, along with confiscation of chickens, raising of houses, or destruction of villages, we can also make effective use of one o o pounds of explosives per person, one two tons per square mile, as in Vietnam, as a technique for controlling behavior, relying on the principle. Now once again confirmed by experiment, that satisfaction of desires is a more important motivation in human behavior than abstract to appeals to loyalty. Surely this is extremely sane advice. It would, for example, be absurd to try to control the behavior of a rat by winning its loyalty rather than by the proper scheduling of reinforcement. An added advantage of this new more scientific approach is that it will modify the attitudes with which counterinsurgency efforts are viewed in the United States. 34. When we turn to the United States, of course, we are concerned with people whose attitudes must be taken into account, not merely their behalf or. It will help us overcome one of the main defects in the American character, 
the emotional reaction that leads us to side with crusaders from the common man and against a ruthless, exploitative tyrant, that there may be reality as well as appearance in this role casting is not the point. This sentimentality frequently interferes with a realistic assessment of alternatives, and inclines us instead toward a carping righteousness in our relations with the beleaguered government we are ostensibly supporting. It may be overcome by concentration on control of behavior rather than modification of attitudes or the winning of hearts and minds. Hence the new approach to counterinsurgency should not only be effective in extending the control of American-approved governments, but it may also have a beneficial effect on us. The possibilities are awe-inspiring. Perhaps in this way we can even escape the confines of our guilt culture in which there is a tradition of belief in equality. It is extremely important, Wolf would claim, that we develop. 66. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship A rational understanding of insurgency, for insurgency is probably the most likely type of political military threat in the Third World and surely one of the most complex and challenging problems facing United States policies and programs. The primary objective of American foreign policy in the Third World must be the denial of communist control, specifically, the support of countries that are defending their independence from external and internal communist domination. The latter problem, defending independence from internal communist domination, is the crucial problem particularly in Latin America. We must counter the threat by a policy of promoting economic growth and modernization, making sure, however, to avoid the risks inherent in these processes cf. Mitchell, combined with a responsible use of force. No question is raised about the appropriateness of a use of force in a country threatened by insurgency. The justification, with the question raised, is inherent in the assumption that we live in a world in which loss of national independence is often synonymous with communist control, and communism is implicitly considered to be reversible. Thus, by Orwellian logic, we are actually defending national independence when we intervene with military force to protect a ruling elite from internal insurgency. 35. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of scholarly work such as this is the way in which behavioral science rhetoric is used to lend a vague aura of respectability. One might construct some such chain of associations as this. Science, as everyone knows, is responsible, moderate, unsentimental, and otherwise good. Behavioral science tells us that we can be concerned only with behavior and control of behavior. Therefore we should be concerned only with behavior and control of behavior. 36 And it is responsible, moderate, unsentimental, and otherwise good to control behavior by appropriately applied reward and punish. I semicolon 1. American power a-n-d-t-h-e-n-u-man-r-i-n-s. Meant. Concern for loyalties and attitudes is emotional and unscientific. As rational men, believers in the scientific ethic, we should be concerned with manipulating behavior in a desirable direction, and not be deluded by mystical notions of freedom, individual needs, or popular will. Let me make it clear that I am not criticizing the behavioral sciences because they lend themselves to such perversion. On middle dot other grounds, the behavioral persuasion seems to me to lack merit. It seriously mistakes the method of science and imposes pointless methodological strictures on the study of man and society, but this is another matter entirely. It is, however, fair to inquire to what extent the popularity of this approach is based middle dot on its demonstrated achievements, and to what extent its appeal is based on the ease with which it can be refashioned as a new coercive ideology with a faintly scientific tone. In passing, I think it is worth mention that the same questions can be raised outside of politics, specifically, in connection with education and therapy. 
the assumption that the colonial power is benevolent and has the interests of the natives at heart is as old as imperialism itself. Thus the liberal Herman Merivale, lecturing at Oxford in 1840, lauded the British policy of colonial enlightenment which stands in contrast to that of our ancestors who cared little about the internal government of their colonies, and kept them in subjection in order to derive certain supposed commercial advantages from them, whereas we give them commercial advantages, and tax ourselves for their benefit, in order to give them an interest in remaining under our supremacy, that we may have the pleasure of governing them. 37 and our own John Hay in 1898 outlined a partnership in beneficence which would bring freedom and civilization to Cuba, Hawaii, and the Philippines, just as the Pax Britannica had brought these bene. 58. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. Fits to India, Egypt, and South Africa. 38. But although the benevolence of imperialism is a familiar refrain, the idea that the issue of benevolence is irrelevant, an improper, sentimental consideration, is something of an innovation in imperialist rhetoric, a contribution of the sort one might perhaps expect from the new mandarins whose claim to power is based on knowledge and technique. Going a step beyond, notice how perverse is the entire discussion of the conceptual framework for counterinsurgency. The idea that we must choose between the method of winning hearts and minds and the method of shaping behavior presumes that we have the right to choose at all. This is to grant us a right that we would surely accord to no other world power. Yet the overwhelming body of American scholarship accords us this right. For example, William Henderson, formerly Associate Middle Dot Executive Director and Far Eastern Specialist for the Council on Foreign Relations, proposes that we must prosecute a constructive, manipulative diplomacy in order to deal with internal subversion, particularly in the form of communist-instigated guerrilla warfare or insurgency, internal aggression, as he calls it, in accordance with contemporary usage. 39 are historic tasks, he proclaims and nothing less than to assist purpose fully and constructively in the processes of modern nation building in Southeast Asia, to deflect the course of a fundamental revolution into channels compatible with the long-range middle dot interests of the United States. It is understood that true nation building is that path of development compatible with our interests, hence there is no difficulty in pursuing these historic tasks in concert. There are, however, two real stumbling blocks in the way of the required manipulative diplomacy. The first is a great psychological barrier. We must learn to abandon old dogma and pursue a new diplomacy that is frankly enter. 59. American power and the new mander are Ryanes. Venturist, recognizing that it goes counter to all the traditional conventions of diplomatic usage. Some may ask whether we have the moral right to interfere in the properly autonomous affairs of others, but Henderson feels that the communist threat fully justifies such interference and urges that we be ready to use our special forces when the next bell rings, with no moral qualms or hesitation. The second barrier is that our knowledge has pitifully inadequate. He therefore calls on the academic community which will be only too willing to oblige, to supply the body of expertise and the core of specialists, the knowledge, the practitioners, and the teachers, to enable us to conduct such a resourceful diplomacy more effectively. Turning to the liberal wing, we find that Roger Hilsman has a rather similar message in his study of the diplomacy of the Kennedy administration, to move a nation. He informs us that the most divisive issue among the hard-headed and pragmatic liberals of the Kennedy team was how the United States should deal with the problem of modern guerrilla warfare, as the communists practice it. The problem is that this is internal war, an ambiguous aggression that avoids direct and open attack violating international frontiers, italics his. Apparently, 
the hard-headed and pragmatic liberals were never divided on this issue of our right to violate international frontiers in reacting to such internal war. As a prime example of the kind of critical, searching analysis that the new, liberal, revitalized State Department was trying to encourage, Hilsman cites a study directed to showing how the United States might have acted more effectively to overthrow the Mossadegh government in Iran. Alan Dulles was fundamentally right, as according to Hilsman, in judging that Mossadegh in Iran, like Arbenz in Guatemala, had come to power, to be sure. 80. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Through the usual processes of government, with the intention of creating a communist state a most amazing statement on the part of the State Department Chief of Intelligence, and Dulles was fundamentally right in urging support from the United States to loyal anti-communist elements in Iran and Guatemala to meet the danger, even though no invitation was extended by the government in power, obviously. Hilsman expresses the liberal view succinctly in the distinction he draws between the Iranian subversion and the blundering attempt at the Bay of Pigs. It is one thing to help the Shah's supporters in Iran in their struggle against Mossadegh and his communist allies, but it is something else again to sponsor a thou Sandman invasion against Castro's Cuba, where there was no effective internal opposition. The former effort was admirable. The latter, bound to fail, is something else again from the point of view of pragmatic liberalism. In Vietnam liberal interventionism was not properly conducted, and the situation got out of hand. We learn more about the character of this approach to international affairs by studying a more successful instance. Thailand is a case in point and a useful perspective on liberal American ideology is given by the careful and informative work of Frank C. Darling, a Kennedy liberal who was a CIA analyst for Southeast Asia and is now chairman of the political science department at DePaul University. 40. The facts relevant to this discussion, as Darling outlines them, are briefly as follows. At the end of World War II, the former British minister, Sir Josiah Crosby, warned that unless the power of the Thai armed forces was reduced, the establishment of a constitutional government would be doomed and the return of a military dictatorship would be inevitable. American policy in the post-war period was to support and 61. American Power and Thenu Manda R. I. N. S. Strengthen the armed forces and the police and Crosby's prediction was borne out. There were incipient steps towards constitutional government in the immediate post-war period. However, a series of military coups established by Bun Songram, who had collaborated with the Japanese during the war, as Premier in 1948, aborting these early efforts. The American reaction to the liberal governments had been ambiguous and temporizing. In contrast, Phi Ben was immediately recognized by the United States. Why? Within this increasingly turbulent region Thailand was the only nation that did not have a communist insurrection within its borders and it was the only country that remained relatively stable and calm. As the United States considered measures to deter communist aggression in Southeast Asia, a conservative and anti-communist regime in Thailand became increasingly attractive regardless of its internal policies or methods of achieving power. Phi Ben got the point. In August 1949, he stated that foreign pressure had become alarming and that internal communist activity had vigorously increased. In 1950, Truman approved a $10 million grant for military aid. The new rulers made use of the substantial American military aid to convert the political system into a more powerful and ruthless form of authoritarianism, and to develop an extensive system of corruption, nepotism, and profiteering that helped maintain the loyalty of their followers. At the same time, American corporations moved in, purchasing large quantities of rubber and tin. 
shipments of raw materials now went directly to the United States instead of through Hong Kong and Singapore. Zero by 1958, the United States purchased 90 per middle dot cent of Thailand's rubber and most of its tin. American investment, however, remained low because of the political in. E2. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. Stability as well as the problems caused by more extensive public ownership and economic planning. To improve matters, the Sarid dictatorship, see below, introduced tax benefits and guarantees against nationalization and competition from government-owned commercial enterprises, and finally banned trade with China and abolished all monopolies, government or private in an attempt to attract private foreign capital. American influence gave material and moral support to the Fiban dictatorship and discouraged the political opposition. It strengthened the executive power and encouraged the military leaders to take even stronger measures in suppressing local opposition, using the excuse that all anti-government activity was communist-inspired. In 1954, a liberal intellectual who had been the major participant in the overthrow of the absolute monarchy in 1932, had led the Free Thai Underground during the war, and had been elected in 1946 when Thai democracy reached an all-time high, appeared in communist China, the United States was supporting Phi Ben, who had been an ally of the Japanese, while Pretty who had courageously assisted the OSS, was in Peking cooperating with the Chinese communists. This was ironic. It is difficult to imagine what sort of development towards a constitutional, parliamentary system might have taken place had it not been for American-supported subversion. The liberals were extremely weak in any event, in particular because of the domination of the economy by Western and Chinese enterprises linked with a corrupt governmental bureaucracy. The coup group that had overthrown the government was composed almost entirely of commoners, many of whom had come from the peasantry or low-ranking military and civil service families, and who now wanted their share in corruption and authoritarian control. The opposition Democrats were, for the most, 63. American Power and the Enumander R.I.N.S. Part, members of the royal family or conservative landowners who wanted to preserve their role in the government and their personal wealth. Whatever opportunities might have existed for the development of some more equitable society disappeared once the American presence became dominant, however, Surely any Thai liberal reformer must have been aware of this by 1950, in the wake of the coups, the farcical rigged elections, the murder and torture of leaders of the free Thai anti-Japanese underground, the takeover by the military of the political and much of the commercial system particularly when he listened to the words of American Ambassador Stanton as he signed a new aid agreement. The American people fully support this program of aid to Thailand because of their deep interest in the Thai people whose devotion to the ideals of freedom and liberty and wholehearted support of the UN have won the admiration of the American people. A notable trend throughout this period was the growing intimacy between the Thai military leaders and the top-level military officials from the United States who helped them obtain large-scale foreign aid which in turn bolstered their political power. The head of the American military mission, Colonel Charles Shelton, stated that Thailand was threatened by armed aggression by people who do not believe in democracy, who do not believe in freedom or the dignity of the individual man as do the people of Thailand and my country. Edly Sweet Fenson, in 1953 warned the Thai leaders that their country was the real target of the Viet Minh, and expressed his hope that they fully appreciate the threat. Meanwhile, United States assistance had built a powerful army and supplied the police with tanks, artillery, armored cars, an air force, naval patrol vessels, and a training school for paratroopers. The police achieved one of the highest ratios of policemen to citizens in their 
64. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship. World about 1 to 400. The police chief meanwhile relied on his monopoly of the opium trade and his extensive commercial enterprises for the income he needed to support his personal political machine, while the army chief received an enormous income from the national lottery. It was later discovered that the chief of police had committed indescribable atrocities, the extent of the torture and murder middle dot committed by the former police chief will probably never be known. What is known is what came to light after Sarat, the army chief, took power in a new coup in 195-7. Sarat stressed the need to maintain a stable government and intensify the middle dot suppression of local communists to ensure continued American trust confidence and aid. The Americans were naturally gratified, and the official reaction was very favorable. When, Sarat died in 1963 it was discovered that his personal fortune reached perhaps $1.37 million. Both Darling and Roger Hilsman refer to him as a benevolent dictator, perhaps because he realized that communism could not be stopped solely by mass. Arrests firing squads, or threats of brutal punishment, and launched a development project in the northeast regions, along with various other mild reforms without, however, seizing the former practices, which he felt might impress the middle dot Americans again with the need for more military and economic aid to prevent communist subversion. He also imposed rigid censorship abolished trade organizations and labor unions and punished suspected communists without mercy, and, as noted earlier, took various steps to attract foreign investment. By 1960, 12% of American foreign aid to Thailand since the beginning of the Cold War had been devoted to economic and social advancement. The effect of the American aid was clear. The vast material and diplomatic support provided to the military leaders by the United States helped to prevent the middle dot. E S. Dot equals. A M E R I can power A N D T H E N U M A N D A R R I N S. Emergence of any competing groups who might check the trend toward absolute political rule and lead the country back to a more modern form of government. Italics mine. In fiscal 1963, the Kennedy administration tried to obtain from Congress $50 million in military aid for Thailand, perhaps to commemorate these achievements. The Kennedy administration brought good intentions and well-founded policy proposals, but otherwise made no significant modifications in the military-oriented policy in Thailand. These excerpts give a fair picture of the American impact on Thailand, as it emerges from Darling's account. Naturally, he is not too happy about it. He is disturbed that American influence frustrated the moves towards constitutional democracy and contributed to an autocratic rule responsible for atrocities that sometimes rival those of the Nazis and the Communists. He is also disturbed by a failure to achieve real control, in his terms, security and stability, through these measures. Thus, when Sarat took power in the 195-7 coup, the Americans had no assurance that he would not orient a new regime towards radical economic and social programs and Castro, for example, as Mittel dot den in Cuba. At stake was an investment of about $300 million in military equipment and a gradually expanding economic base which could have been used against American interests in Southeast Asia had it fallen into unfriendly hands. Fortunately, these dire consequences did not ensue, and in place of radical economic and social programs there was merely a continuation of the same old terror and corruption. The danger was real, however. What conclusions does Darling draw from this record? As he sees it, 42, there are four major alternatives for American foreign policy. The first would be to abolish its military program and with objectivity and liberal scholarship. 
withdraw American troops from the country. This, however, would be irrational because throughout the non-communist world respect for American patience and tolerance in dealing with non-democratic governments would decline. Furthermore, Thailand's security and economic progress would be jeopardized. To the pragmatic liberal, it is clear that confidence in our commitment to military dictatorships such as that in Thailand must be maintained, as in fact was implied by the moderate scholars document discussed earlier and it would surely be unfortunate to endanger the prospects for further development along the lines that were initiated in such a promising way under American influence, and that are now secured by some 40,000 American troops. A second alternative would be neutralization of Thailand and other nations in Southeast Asia. This also is irrational. For one thing, the withdrawal of the American military presence would not be matched by the removal of any communist forces there being no non-indigenous communist forces and therefore we would gain nothing by this strategy. Furthermore, we middle dot could never be certain that there would not be infiltration of communist insurgents in the future. And finally, the Thai leaders have decided to cooperate with the United States, for reasons that are hardly obscure. A third alternative would be to use our power in Thailand to push political and economic reforms. But this policy alternative would do great damage to American strategy in Thailand and other non-communist nations. And what is more, extensive interference in the domestic affairs of other nations, no middle dot matter how well intentioned, is contrary to American traditions as our post-war record in Thailand clearly demonstrates. 43. Therefore, we must turn to the fourth alternative, and main. Anti. Equals. American power and the new manda are Ryan's. Tain our present policy. This alternative is probably the most rational and realistic. The military policy can be enhanced if it is realized that only American military power is capable of underscore preventing large-scale overt aggression in Southeast Asia, and the proper role for the Thai armed forces is to be prepared to middle dot cope with limited guerrilla warfare. This exposition of United States policy in Thailand and the directions it should take conforms rather well to the general lines of pragmatic liberalism as drawn by Hilsman among others. It also indicates clearly the hope that we offer today to the middle dot countries on the fringes of Asia. Vietnam may be an aberration. Our impact on Thailand, however, can hardly be attributed to the politics of inadvertence. An interesting sidelight is Darling's explanation in Thailand and the United States of how, in an earlier period, the Western concept of the rule of law was disseminated through American influence. Evidence that some officials were obtaining an understanding of the rule of law was revealed by the statement of a Thai minister who pointed out that it is essential to their prosperity of a nation that it should have fixed laws, and that nobles should be restrained from oppressing the people, otherwise the latter were like chickens, who instead of being kept for their eggs, were killed off. In its international behavior as well, the Thai government came to understand the necessity for the rule of law. A growing respect for law was also revealed in the adherence of the Thai government to the unequal restrictions contained in the treaties with the Western nations in spite of the heavy burden they imposed on the finances of the kingdom. This is all said without irony. In fact, the examples clarify nicely what the rule of law means to weak nations, and to the exploited in any society. Darling, Hilsman, and many others whom I have been dis. 68. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Cussing represent the moderate liberal wing of scholarship on international affairs. It may be useful to sample some of the other views that appear in American scholarship. Consider for example, the proposals of Thomas R. Adam, Professor of Political Science at New York University. 44. Adam begins by outlining an ideal solution to American problems in the Pacific, towards which we should bend our efforts. 
the ideal solution would have the United States recognized as the responsible military protagonist of all Western interests in the area with a predominant voice in a unified Western policy. United States sovereignty over some territorial base in the area would give us ideal conditions for extending power over adjoining regions. Such a base would permit the middle dot formation of a regional organization, under our dominance, that would make possible direct intervention in Korea, Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia without the onus of unilateral intervention, in the face of brazen communist aggression. It is not the fact of intervention as such that constitutes the issue but rather its unilateral character. We must understand that for the preservation of Western interests, there is no reasonable alternative to the construction of such a base of power in territories over which we possess direct sovereignty. We cannot maintain the historic connection between Asia and the West unless we participate in Asian affairs through the exercise of power and influence. We must accept the fact that we are engaged in a serious struggle for cultural survival that involves that continuous presence of Western-oriented communities in Asia. It is an illusion to believe that we can retreat from Asia and leave it to its own devices. For our own Western culture must be understood as a minority movement of recent date in the evolution of civilization. And it cannot be taken for granted that Asia will remain. 6 9 Middle Dot. American Power and the Enumanda R. Ryan's. Incapable of intervening in our affairs. First to defend ourselves, we must intervene with force in the affairs of Asia. If we fail to establish our industrial enterprise system universally, we will have to defend our privileges and gains by means of the continuing, brutalizing, and costly exercise of superior force in every corner of the globe. Why are we justified in forceful intervention in the affairs of Asia? One obvious justification for the United States intervention in Asian affairs lies in our leadership of the world's struggle against communism. Communist political and economic infiltration among a majority of the world's peoples appears to American political leadership to be fatal to our safety and progress. This attitude is supported almost unanimously by public opinion. Pursuing this logic a few steps further, we will soon have the same obvious justification for taking out China with new dear weapons and perhaps France as well, for good measure. Further justification is that the defense of our western seaboard requires that the North Pacific be controlled as a virtual American lake, a fact which provides one basis for United States intervention in power struggles throughout the region, to preserve the security of this menostrum. Our victory over Japan left a power vacuum in Southeast Asia and the Far East that was tempting to communist aggression, therefore, we had to step in and use our military power. Island possessions, such as Guam, those of the Strategic Trust Territories, and probably Okinawa, remain indispensable, if not to the narrow defense of zero air shores, certainly to the military posture essential to our total security and world aims. 45 Apart from the magnificent scope of this vision, rarely equaled by our foreigners, the terminology is not unfamiliar. There are, to be sure, certain restraints that we must observe. 70. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship As we design our policy of establishing an operational base for exercise of power in the Far East, specifically, policy must rest on political and social objectives that are acceptable to, or capable of being imposed upon, all participating elements. Obviously, it would not be pragmatic to insist upon policies that are not capable of being imposed upon the participating elements in our new dominions. These proposals are buttressed with a brief sketch of the consequences of Western dominion in the past, for example, the Indian success story, in which enterprise capital proved a useful incentive to fruitful social change in the subcontinent of India and its environs. 
a development flawed only by the passivity shown by traditional Asian social systems as they imitated the industrial ideology of their colonial tutor. An important lesson to us is the success of the neutral Pax Britannica in imposing order, so that commerce could flourish and its fruits compensate for vanished liberties. Adam spares us the observation that the ungrateful natives sometimes fail to appreciate but these centuries of solicitude. Thus to a left-wing member of the Congress party in India, the story is that the British, in the process of their domination over India, kept no limits to brutality and savagery which man is capable of practicing. Hitler's depredations, his Dachau's and Belsen's, pale into insignificance before this imperialist savagery. 46 such a reaction to centuries of selfless and tender care might cause some surprise, until we realize that it is probably only an expression of the enormous guilt felt by the beneficiary of these attentions. A generation ago, there were other political leaders who feared the effect of communist gains on their safety and progress, and who, with the almost unanimous support of public opinion, set out to improve the world through forceful inter. 71. A M E R I can power A N D T A C N U M A N D A R I N S. Vention filling power vacuums, establishing territorial bases essential to their total security and world aims, imposing political and social objectives on participating elements. Professor Adam has little to tell us that is new. 2. The examples of counter-revolutionary subordination that I have so far cited have for the most part been drawn from political science and the study of international, particularly Asian, affairs rather dismal branches of American scholarship, by and large and so closely identified with American imperial goals that one is hardly astonished to discover the widespread abandonment of civilized norms. In opening this discussion, however, I refer to a far more general issue. If it is plausible that ideology will in general serve as a mask for self-interest, then it is a natural presumption that intellectuals, in interpreting history or formulating policy, will tend to adopt an elitist position, condemning popular movements and mass participation in decision-making, and emphasizing rather the necessity for supervision by those who possess the knowledge and understanding that is required, so they claim, to manage society and control social change. This is hardly a novel thought. One major element in the anarchist critique of Marxism a century ago was the prediction that as Bakunin formulated it. According to the theory of Mr. Marx, the people not only must not destroy the state, but must strengthen it and place it at the complete disposal of their benefactors, guardians, and teachers the leaders of the Communist Party, namely Mr. Marx and his friends, who will proceed to liberate mankind in their own way. They will concentrate the reins of government in a strong hand because the ignorant people require an exceedingly firm guardianship, they will establish a single state bank, concentrate. 7. Objectivity and liberal scholarship. In in its hands all commercial, industrial, agricultural and even scientific production, and then divide the masses into two armies industrial and agricultural under the direct command of the state engineers, who will constitute a new privileged scientific political estate. 47. One cannot fail to be struck by the parallel between this prediction and that of Daniel Bell, cited earlier the prediction that in the new post-industrial society, not only the best talents, but eventually the entire complex of social prestige and social status, will be rooted in the intellectual and scientific communities. 48. Pursuing the parallel for a moment, it might be asked whether the left-wing critique of Leninist elitism can be applied, under very different conditions, to the liberal ideology of the intellectual elite that aspires to the dominant role in managing the welfare state. Rosa Luxemburg, in 1918, 
argued that Bolshevik elitism would lead to a state of society in which the bureaucracy alone would remain an active element in social life though now it would be the red bureaucracy of that state socialism that Bakunin had long before described as the most violent terrible eye that our century has created. 49 A true social revolution requires a spiritual transformation in the masses degraded by centuries of bourgeois class rule. 50. It is only by extirpating the habits of obedience and civility to the last root that the working class can acquire the understanding of a new form of discipline, self-discipline arising from free consent. 51. Writing in 1904, she predicted that Lenin's organizational concepts would enslave a young labor movement to an intellectual elite hungry for power and turn it into an automaton manipulated by a central committee. 52 In the Bolshevik elitist doctrine of 1918 she saw a disparagement of the creative, spontaneous, self-correcting force of mass action, which alone, and she. 73 Amari California when power and T-H-E-N-U-M-A-N-R-I-N-S argued could solve the thousand problems of social reconstruction and produce the spiritual transformation that is the essence of a true social revolution, as Bolshevik practice hardened into dogma, the fear of popular initiative and spontaneous mass action, not under the direction and control of the properly designated vanguard, became a dominant element of so-called communist ideology antagonism to mass movements and to social change that escapes the control of privileged elites is also a prominent feature of contemporary liberal ideology. 53 expressed as foreign policy, it takes the form described earlier. To conclude this discussion of counter-revolutionary subordination, I would like to investigate how, in one rather crucial case, this particular bias in American liberal ideology can be detected even in the interpretation of events of the past in which American involvement was rather slight, and in historical work of very high caliber. In 1966, the American Historical Association gave its biennial award for the most outstanding work on European history to Gabriel Jackson his study of Spain in the 1930s.54 There is no question that of the dozens of books on this period, Jackson's is among the best, and I do not doubt that the award was well deserved. The Spanish Civil War is one of the crucial events of modern history, and one of the most extensively studied as well. In it, we find the interplay of forces and ideas that have dominated European history since the Industrial Revolution. What is more, the relationship of Spain to the great powers was in many respects like that of the countries of what is now called the Third World. In some ways, then, the events of the Spanish Civil War give a foretaste of what the future may hold, as Third World revelations are proud traditional societies threaten imperial dominance, exacerbate great power rivalries, and bring the world. 74. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Perilously close to a war which, if not averted, will surely be the final catastrophe of modern history. My reason for wanting to investigate an outstanding liberal analysis of the Spanish Civil War is therefore twofold. First, because of the intrinsic interest of these events, and second, because of the insight that this analysis may provide with respect to the underlying elitist bias which I believe to be at the root of the phenomenon of counter-revolutionary subordination. In his study of the Spanish Republic, Jackson makes no attempt to hide his own commitment in favor of liberal democracy, as represented by such figures as Azafia, Cazares Quiroga. Martinez Barrio, 55 and the other responsible national leaders. In taking this position, he speaks for much of liberal scholarship. It is fair to say that figures similar to those just mentioned would be supported by American liberals, were this possible, in Latin America, Asia, or Africa. Furthermore, Jackson makes little attempt to disguise his antipathy towards the forces of popular revolution in Spain, 
or their goals. It is no criticism of Jackson's study that his point of view and sympathies are expressed with such clarity. On the contrary, the value of this work as an interpretation of historical events is enhanced by the fact that the author's commitments are made so clear and explicit. But I think it can be shown that Jackson's account of the popular revolution that took place in Spain is misleading and in part quite unfair and that the failure of objectivity it reveals is highly significant in that it is characteristic of the attitude taken by liberal and communist intellectuals towards revolutionary movements that are largely spontaneous and only loosely organized, while rooted in deeply felt needs and ideals of dispossessed masses. It is a convention of scholarship that the use of such terms as those of the, the preceding phrase demonstrates naivety and muddle-headed sentimental. 75. American power and the Enumanda R. Brian S. Itty. The convention, however, is supported by ideological conviction rather than history or investigation of the phenomena of social life. This conviction is, I think, Belied by such events as the revolution that swept over much of Spain in the summer of 1936. The circumstances of Spain in the 1930s are not duplicated elsewhere in the underdeveloped world today, to be sure. Nevertheless, the limited information that we have about popular movements in Asia, specifically, suggests certain similar features that deserve much more serious and sympathetic study than they have so far received. 56 Inadequate information makes it hazardous to try to develop any such parallel, but I think it is quite possible to note long-standing tendencies in the response of liberal as well as communist intellectuals to such mass move middle. Menti S. As I have already remarked, the Spanish Civil War is not only one of the critical events of modern history but one of the most intensively studied as well. Yet there are surprising gaps. During the months following the Franco insurrection in July 1, 1936, a social revolution of unprecedented scope took place throughout much of Spain. It had no revolutionary vanguard and appears to have been largely spontaneous involving masses of urban and rural laborers in a radical transformation of social and economic conditions that persisted, with remarkable success, until it was crushed by force. This predominantly anarchist revolution and the massive social transformation to which it gave rise are treated, in recent historical studies, as a kind of aberration a nuisance that stood in the way of successful prosecution of the war to save the bourgeois regime from the Franco rebellion. Many historians would probably agree with Eric Hobsbawm 57 that the failure of social revolution in Spain was due to the anarchists, that anarchism was a disaster, a kind of. 76. Objectivity and liberal scholarship moral gymnastics with no concrete results, at best a profoundly moving spectacle for the student of popular religion. The most extensive historical study of the anarchist revolution 58 is relatively inaccessible, and neither its author, now living in southern France, nor the many refugees who will never write memoirs but who might provide invaluable personal testimony have been consulted, apparently by writers of the major historical works. 59 The one published collection of documents dealing with collectivization 60 has been published only by an anarchist press and hence is barely accessible to the general reader, and has also rarely been consulted it does not, for example, appear in Jackson's bibliography, though Jackson's account is intended to be a social and political, not merely a military, history. In fact, this astonishing social upheaval seems to have largely passed from memory. The drama and pathos of the Spanish Civil War have by no means faded, witness the impact a few years ago of the film To Die in Madrid. Yet in this film, as Daniel Guerin points out, one finds no reference to the popular revolution that had transformed much of Spanish society. 
I will be concerned here with the events of 1936-1937,61 and with one particular aspect of the complex struggle involving Franco-nationalists, Republicans, including the Communist Party, anarchists, and socialist workers' groups. The Franco insurrection in July 1, 1936 came against a background of several months of strikes, expropriations, and battles between peasants and civil guards. The left-wing socialist leader Largo Caballero had demanded in June that the workers be armed, but was refused by Azafia. When the coup came, the Republican government was paralyzed. Workers armed themselves in Madrid and Barcelona robbing government armories and even ships in the harbor, and put down the insurrection while the government vacillated, torn between the twin dangers of submitting to. 11. American Power and Thenu Manda R. I. N. S. Franco and arming the working classes. In large areas of Spain effective authority passed into the hands of the anarchist and socialist workers who had played a substantial, generally dominant role in putting down the insurrection. The next few months have frequently been described as a period of dual power. In Barcelona industry and commerce were largely collectivized, and a wave of collectivization spread through rural areas, as well as towns and villages in Aragon, Castile, and the Levant, and to a lesser but still significant extent in many parts of Catalonia, Asturias, Extremadura, and Andalusia. Military power was exercised by defense committees, social and economic organization took many forms, following in main outlines the program of the Saragossa Congress of the Anarchist CNT in May 1, 1936. The revelation was a political, in the sense that its organs of power and administration remained separate from the central republican government and, even after several anarchist leaders entered the government in the autumn of 1936, continued to function fairly independently until the revolution was finally crushed between the fascist and communist-led republican forces. The success of collectivization of industry and commerce in Barcelona impressed even highly unsympathetic observers such as Borcano. The scale of rural collectivization is indicated by these data from anarchist sources. In Aragon, 450 collectives with half a million members, in the Levant, 900 collectives are counting for about half the agricultural production and 70% of marketing in this, the richest agricultural region of Spain, in Castile, 300 collectives with about 100,000 members.62 in Catalonia, the bourgeois government headed by campaigners retained nominal authority, but real power was in the hands of the anarchist-dominated committees. The period of July through H. September may be characterized. 78. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship As one of spontaneous, widespread, but unconsummated social revolution. 63. A number of anarchist leaders joined the government. The reason, as stated by Frederick Monson e. on January 3, 1st 93 7, was this. The anarchists have entered the government to prevent the revelation from deviating and in order to carry it further beyond the war, and also to oppose any dictatorial tendency, from wherever it might come. 84 The central government fell increasingly under communist control in Catalonia, under the control of the communist-dominated sect largely as a result of the valuable Russian military assistance. Communist success was greatest in the rich farming areas of the Levant. The government moved to Valencia, capital of one of the provinces, where prosperous farm owners flocked to the peasant federation that the party had organized to protect the wealthy farmers. This federation served as a powerful instrument in checking the rural collectivization promoted by the agricultural workers of the province. 65 Elsewhere as well. Counter-revolutionary successes reflected increasing communist dominance of the republic.
the first phrase of the counter-revolution was the legalization and regulation of those accomplishments of the revelation that appeared irreversible. A decree of October 7 by the Communist Minister of Agriculture, Vincent D. Ribe, legalized certain expropriations namely, of lands belonging to participants in the Franco Revolt. Of course, these expropriations had already taken place a fact that did not prevent the communist press from describing the decree as the most profoundly revolutionary measure that has been taken since the military uprising. 68 In fact, by exempting the estates of landowners who had not directly participated in the Franco rebellion, the decree represented a step backward, from the standpoint of the revolutionaries, and it was criticized not only by the CNT but also by 79. Amari California and Power and THEN Umanda R. Brian S. The Socialist Federation OF Land Workers, affiliated with the UGT. The demand for a much broader degree was unacceptable to the Communist led ministry, since the Communist Party was seeking support among the propertied classes in the anti Franco coup and hence could not afford to repel the small and medium proprietors who had been hostile to the working class movement before the Civil War. 67 These small proprietors, in fact, seem to have included owners of substantial estates. The decree compelled tenants to continue paying rent unless the landowners had supported Franco, and by guaranteeing former landholdings, it prevented distribution of land to the village poor. Ricardo Zabalza, General Secretary of the Federation of Land Workers, described the resulting situation as one of galling injustice. The sycophants of the former political bosses still enjoy a privileged position at the expense of those persons who were unable to rent even the smallest parcel of land, because they were revolutionaries. 68. To complete the stage of legalization and restriction of what had already been achieved, a decree of October 24, 1936, promulgated by a CNT member who had become councillor for economy in the Catalonian Generalitat gave legal sanction to the collectivization of industry in Catalonia. In this case, too, the step was regressive, from the revelationary point of view. Collectivization was limited to enterprises employing more than a hundred workers, and a variety of conditions were established that removed control from the workers' committees to the state bureaucracy. 611. The second stage of the counter-revolution from October 193-6 through May 1st 937, involved the destruction of the local committees, the replacement of the militia by a conventional army, and the re-establishment of the pre-revolutionary social and economic system, wherever this was possible. Finally, in 80. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship May 1st 93-7 came a direct attack on the working class in Barcelona, the May days.7 degrees following the success of this attack, the process of liquidation of the revelation was completed. The collectivization decree of October 24 was rescinded and industries were freed from workers' control. Communist-led armies swept through Aragon, destroying many collectives and dismantling their organizations and, generally, bringing the area under the control of the central government. Throughout the Republican-held territories, the government, now under communist domination, acted in accordance with the plan announced in Pravda on December 1, 7, 1936. So far as Catalonia is concerned, the cleaning up of Trotskyist and Anacho syndicalist elements there has already begun and it will be carried out there with the same energy as in the USSR 71 and, we may add, in much the same manner. In brief, the period from the summer of 1936 to 1937 was one of revelation and counter-revolution, the revelation was largely spontaneous with mass participation of anarchist and socialist industrial and agricultural workers, the counter-revolution was under communist direction, the Communist Party increasingly coming to represent the right wing of the Republic.
during this period and after the success of the counter-revolution, the Republic was waging a war against the Franco insurrection. This had been described in great detail in numerous publications, and I will say little about it here. The communist-led counter-revolutionary struggle must, of course, be understood against the background of the ongoing anti-fascist war and the more general attempt of the Soviet Union to construct a broad anti-fascist alliance with the Western democracies. One reason for the vigorous counter-revolutionary policy of the communists was their belief that England would never tolerate a revolutionary triumph in Spain, where England had substantial com. S1. American power and the Enumander R. Ryan S. Mercial interests, as did France and to a lesser extent the United States. 72 I will return to this matter below. However, I think it is important to bear in mind that there were undoubtedly other factors as well. Rudolf Rocker's comments are, I believe, quite to the point. Dot. The Spanish people have been engaged in a desperate struggle against a pitiless foe and have been exposed besides to the secret intrigues of the great imperialist powers of Europe. Despite this the Spanish revolutionaries have not grasped at the disastrous expedient of dictatorship, but have respected all honest convictions. Everyone who visited Barcelona after the July battles, whether friend or foe of the CNT, was surprised at the freedom of public life and the absence of any arrangements for suppressing the free expression of opinion. For two decades the supporters of Bolshevism have been hammering it into the masses that dictatorship is a vital necessity for the defense of the so-called proletarian interests against the assaults of the counter-revolution and for paving the way for socialism. They have not advanced the cause of socialism by this propaganda, but have merely smothered the way for fascism in Italy. Germany and Austria by causing millions of people to forget that dictatorship, the most extreme form of tyranny, can never lead to social liberation. In Russia, the so-called dictatorship of the proletariat has not led to socialism, but to the domination of a new bureaucracy over the proletariat and the whole people. What the Russian autocrats and their supporters fear most is that the success of libertarian socialism in Spain might prove to their blind followers that the much vaunted necessity of a dictatorship is nothing but one vast fraud which in Russia has led to the despotism of Stalin and is to serve today in Spain to help the counter-revolution to a victory over the revelation of the workers and peasants. 73. After decades of anti-communist indoctrination, it is difficult to achieve a perspective that makes possible a serious evaluer. S2. Zero Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship. Shun of the extent to which Bolshevism and Western liberalism have been united in their opposition to popular revolution. However, I do not think that one can comprehend the events in Spain without attaining this perspective. With this brief sketch partisan, but I think accurate for background, I would like to turn to Jackson's account of this aspect of the Spanish Civil War. See note 54. Jackson presumes, p. 259, that Soviet support for the Republican cause in Spain was guided by two factors, first, concern for Soviet security, second, the hope that a Republican victory would advance the cause of worldwide people's revolution with which Soviet leaders hoped to identify themselves. They did not press their revolutionary aims, he feels, because for the moment it was essential not to frighten the middle classes or the Western governments. As to the concern for Soviet security, Jackson is no doubt correct. It is clear that Soviet support of the Republic was one aspect of the attempt to make common cause with the Western democracies against the fascist threat. However, Jackson's conception of the Soviet Union as a revolutionary power hopeful that a Republican victory would advance the interrupted movement toward world revelation and seeking to identify itself with the cause of the worldwide people's revolution seems to me entirely mistaken. 
Jackson presents no evidence to support this interpretation of Soviet policy, nor do I know of any. It is interesting to see how differently the events were interpreted at the time of the Spanish Civil War, not only by anarchists like Crocker but also by such commentators as Gerald Brennan and Franz Borkano, who were intimately acquainted with the situation in Spain. Brennan observes that the counter-revolutionary policy of the communists, which he thinks was extremely sensible, was 83. American power and the Enumanda are INS. The policy most suited to the communists themselves. Russia is a totalitarian regime ruled by a bureaucracy, the frame of mind of its leaders, who have come through the most terrible upheaval in history, is cynical and opportunist, the whole fabric of the state is dogmatic and authoritarian. To expect such men to lead a social revolution in a country like Spain, where the wildest idealism is combined middle dot with great independence of character, was out of the question. The Russians could, it is true, command plenty of idealism among their foreign admirers, but they could only harness it as to the creation of a cast iron bureaucratic state, where everyone thinks alike and obeys the orders of the chief above him. 14. He sees nothing in Russian conduct in Spain to indicate any interest in a people's revolution. Rather, the communist policy was to oppose even such rural and industrial collectives as had risen spontaneously and fled the country with police who, like the Russian Ogpu, acted on the orders of their party rather than those of the Ministry of the Interior. The communists were concerned to suppress altogether the impulses towards spontaneity of speech or action, since their whole nature and history made them distrust the local and spontaneous and put their faith in order, discipline and bureaucratic uniformity hence placed them in opposition to the revolutionary forces in Spain, as Brennan also notes. The Russians withdrew their support once it became clear that the British would not be swayed from the policy of appeasement, a fact which gives additional confirmation to the thesis that only considerations of Russian foreign policy led the Soviet Union to support the remittled public. Borkino's analysis is similar. He approves of the communist policy, because of its efficiency. But he points out that the communists put an end to revolutionary social activity, and enforced their view that this ought not to be a revolution but. 84. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship e. Simply the defense of a legal government. Communist policy in Spain was mainly dictated not by the necessities of the Spanish fight but by the interests of the intervening foreign power, Russia a country with a revolutionary past, not a revolutionary present. The communists acted not with the aim of transforming chaotic enthusiasm into disciplined enthusiasm, which Bolg now feels to have been necessary, but with the aim of substituting disciplined military and administrative action for the action of the masses and getting rid of latter entirely. This policy, he points out went directly against the interests and claims of the masses and thus weakened popular support. The now apathetic masses would not commit themselves to the defense of a communist-run dictatorship, which restored former authority and even showed a definite preference for the police forces of the old regime, so hated by the masses. It seems to me that the record strongly supports this interpretation of the communist policy and its effects. Though Borkino's assumption that communist efficiency was necessary to win the anti-Franco struggle is much more dubious a question to which I return below.75. It is relevant to observe, at this point, that a number of the Spanish communist leaders were reluctantly forced to similar conclusions. Bolletin cites several examples, 76 specifically. The military commander El Campesino and Jesus Hernandez, a minister in the Caballero government. The former, after his escape from the Soviet Union in 1949, 
stated that he had taken for granted the revolutionary solidarity of the Soviet Union during the Civil War a most remarkable degree of innocence and realized only later that the Kremlin does not serve the interests of the peoples of the world, but makes them serve its own interests, that, with a treachery and hypocrisy without parallel, it makes use of the international working class as a 85. A-M-E-R-I California and power A-N-D the N-U-M-A-N-D-A-R-I-N-S. Mere pawn in its political intrigues. Hernandez, in a speech given shortly after the Civil War, admits that the Spanish communist leaders acted more like Soviet subjects than sons of the Spanish people. It may seem absurd, incredible, he adds but our education under Soviet tutelage had deformed us to such an extent that we were completely denationalized, our national soul was torn out of us and replaced by a rabidly chauvinistic internationalism, which began and ended with the towers of the Kremlin. Shortly after the Third World Congress of the Communist International in 192-1, the Dutch ultra-leftist Hermann Gorter wrote that the Congress has decided the fate of the world revolution for the present. The trend of opinion that seriously desired world revolution has been expelled from the Russian international. The communist parties in Western Europe and throughout the world that retain their membership of the Russian international will become nothing more than a means to preserve the Russian revolution and the Soviet Republic. 77 this forecast has proved quite accurate. Jackson's conception that the Soviet Union was a revolutionary power in the late 1930s, or even that the Soviet leaders truly regarded